uh it's uh it's, it's good it's good to see you guys welcome on the welcome to uh the twitch stream right now you guys were supposed to be streaming the the volleyball show this morning or the european volleyball show this morning and it, it didn't it didn't happen Nope. Yeah. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, I'm Rob. That's Dan, and we have a show on the CV YouTube channel every Friday that we were getting ready for. Until Dan found out something very unfortunate about what was going on at the CV office, so I'll let him explain. And then here we are instead. We're just going to talk about Bali, which is what we do. Yeah, unfortunately, like it's no one's fault really, but we just had some server issues at the CV, and. Unfortunately, as I fix my lighting, <laughs> good start. Um, yeah, unfortunately, it just happens, and we had to cancel it last minute. But it's too bad. At the same time, it's fine because we can do it next week, and there's no matches next week, so we're, we're, uh, our prep didn't go to waste. Which That's, is what I'm that is true. That's true. Are we going to get like a Monday show, or are we going to wait until you guys are going to wait until next Friday? I think I think next Friday. All right, cool. But. Uh, yeah, we're gonna do next Friday, and uh, Dan Dan's had some good ideas for some segments that because like yeah, we have a so new, far, new segment coming. Yeah, so far since we've been doing the show, it's just been volleyball, 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 just because there's been so much happening. Like all, all of Champions League, there was really only one week where we didn't have like a lot of actively like ma active matches that week to talk about. So uh, it's been so busy that next week will give us a little bit of freedom to mess around with the show, which I'm excited for. The engagement has been sick. Uh, viewership and like the comments in the live chat has been pretty awesome. So we're stoked about that. Is it flooded with Turkish people? Uh, it's a CEV stream, so obviously. <laughs> one, one, of, one, of the, one of the episodes had a lot of Turkish people. I don't, I don't even know why, but, but there's a good mix. It's actually really nice that there's like such a uh, European and international like, I agree. We've got a couple very knowledgeable, a couple very knowledgeable Italians in there. One seemingly very knowledgeable Polish guy in there, and then a couple like one American who usually tunes in, maybe two, and then you know it just kind of comes from every. And then one Bulgarian, uh, Georgie. He's he's the man. He just asks. He always prepares a question and asks it, it every week. Georgie Smati is that is that who it is? No, it's uh, some some very Bulgarian name. I don't remember his last name. <laughs> some very Bulgarian. Georgie Turzov, I think. That's yeah, something like that. He's great. That's that's awesome. I mean, yeah, it is it is really too bad. I was telling Dan uh, while we were waiting for you, Rob, that I, w I had a bit of a slow morning this morning and was like looking forward to the European volleyball show. I was going to listen to that and do some work, and uh, didn't happen. But then, hey, we're we're able to to come here and talk about what was at abs. To be honest, the past two weeks of European volleyball have been nuts. Have been ridiculous. They've been all time. Yeah. And yes, and to be honest, I think like uh, being on the chat, like the Discord chat too, just makes it way more hyper, way more hype. Too. Oh my god, you guys were were doing the voice chat thing on Tuesday while I was at work, and I had the biggest FOMO of all time. I, I was I was so bummed to be missing out on everybody like chatting on voice on Discord, which was incredible. So that in so much so that during Zaxa Lube during my lunch break while I was at work, I was literally in my car watching on one phone and talking to you guys on discord on the other phone so uh that was a blast the 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 cult we were talking we were raving about the culture of the volleyball source discord it's so much fun i've had such a, so much fun like being a part of it it's gotten me to watch more volleyball too just because it's well, all everybody's talking about yeah absolutely but like you know there's so many times and I, i'm sure we've all been there where we're just at our at home by ourselves headphones on and we're just watching game after game by ourselves and it's 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 boring you know like <laughs> i i've i've always wanted to be able to go like the olympics is the best time ever because then random plebs are just like yo everett did that volleyball games on tv tonight right yeah you want to go watch it at the bar and i'm like yeah let's do it but the rest of the time God, like, volleyball at a bar oh i wish right like it's only happened like a handful like a couple of times um, yeah. <laughs> but other, otherwise, like I'm watching volleyball with my girlfriend who doesn't do, she's doing like, she's learning. She asks questions. She pay attentions. It's, you know, I, I can't ask any more of her, but you know, when uh, she was sitting right beside me, when we were doing the, uh, the chat on Tuesday for the Modena, uh, Perugia game and, uh, yeah, it's 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 fun to to be on there. I'd say the chat. There was more people on the chat on Tuesday, but 
the game was way more hype on Wednesday, so the chat was was yeah. better. You know, you know what I mean. It was. It's because it was closer. Like that that second Modena Perugia battle was not close at all. It actually no. in actually such a way that especially when it got to the golden set and it started to really get out of hand. It was like the least exciting golden set possible. Even mm-hmm. though golden sets are sick, and it's like what we all, what we all root for and, and wish to see. And then when it's fifteen to four or whatever, it's uh, it doesn't quite live up to it. So fortunately, we got another one that was better. Well, Perugia was on, on fire that match. Nice jersey, uh, Dan. If you're if you're listening to this, I am I'm wearing rocking my Wilfredo Leon Perugia jersey. Where, where'd you but get I, that? I totally agree. I just, I mean, you can order the jerseys from their website. Interesting. Really, man. I, they might, they may not deliver to North America. I might. Well, uh, we'll get I got it deli- this last year's version. Yeah. We'll get it delivered they to your deliver to Dan. Yeah, yeah exactly. You, if exactly. you guys want one, just just hit me up and I'll order one for you. I want to. I want a Sharon, a Shawan, uh, mainly Everett. Shawan Vernon Evans, uh, Perugia jersey. I don't, I don't know if you want that one. <laughs> <laughs> that's some. That's some bad mojo. <laughs> uh, Breaks my you heart. mean international hero outside hitter Shawan Vernon Evans? Uh, yeah, breaks, yeah. I break, mean, breaks my heart. Played better as an outside hitter than uh, than opposite so far. Yikes! I, I mean, hey, he came in, brought some fire in that one. The matchup against Modena, it was it was fun Which to they, see. Okay, yeah. why don't we start our volleyball talk with a, with a good discussion? Should Shawan start next? Uh, oh in my the god! Uh, all right, and yeah, here's the case for it: Teister Horst. Uh, not playing that well. He's. I feel like in the last couple of weeks, he's really slowed down. He's almost a borderline liability playing in uh, position two right now. Alexander Tanasevich clearly not healthy. No, there, there's there's no chance. Like he's he's the last person I would start at opposite right now. Agreed. I think Heinen finally Mashi figured Muz- that out too. Mashi Muzai is not gelling with the team. He, he there's must be something going on in practice. He's not. He doesn't have him and Trevica Trevica uh, have not figured out the set together. It leaves only one choice, guys. Shawan. <laughs> Shawan at opposite. Just like he did in Warsaw. Remember? Ever, you'll remember Dude, this. this. In is, Warsaw, the exact same thing happened. This is what I'm saying. Okay, Shawan has... He is a second half of the season guy. You know? He's he's still... No, no, he's, he's, the last, he's the last tenth of the season guy. Okay, well... <laughs> I digress. Okay, going back to Warsaw, 2018, I, b- I believe it was, and you know there was a point where I'm watching Warsaw games and I'm like, ah, oh, crap, that's Shawan in the stands in his like normal clothes because they had, uh, I forget, they had a Brazilian right side and then they went and, and picked up uh, Bartosz Kurek when Secession uh, folded that year. Rafael Rujo. Rafael Rujo, yes, thank you. And then so, so Shawan's. In his like civvies, and I'm like, this isn't good. But then become playoff times, Arujo's gone because he's like, I don't want to play backup behind Kirik. Kirik gets injured, and Shawan's popping off for 20 plus friggin' points in the semifinals and helps Warsaw get their best finish ever in the Plus Liga. So, yeah, I'm all for like Shawan, and like we saw, we saw the fire that he brought uh, in that Modena game. Like we saw it, we were all commenting on it. He hit a great ball out of system. I spoke it into being right did. I, I, did. I called it i was like bring in um you called it at the beginning of set three and he came in about 15 mm-hmm. points in and sure enough it, any chance that Perugia had in that match actually did come from shawan right like i like, will give you that they he, he came in and it was 15 10 he got the side out it was 15 11 he got it up with his serving including an ace was putting pressure on the the rest of the time to, to 15 14 made a service error okay but then they sub him out and then Modena goes back on the run like guys like Heinen what are you doing didn't end up battering Perugia beat him in the second leg so uh, uh, that's a good case for Shawan which you two Canadians can't help but make the case for him uh, my case against him is that it's not it's not anything about Shawan it's about Trevita he 100%. sucks uh, we've been we've been very low on Dragon Trevita all year long uh, I don't understand how it could be hard to set the ball to people like Wilfredo Leon. He's got to be the easiest guy to set of all time. He's such a big window. He doesn't need speed. It, but yeah, Trevita just wants to run this this offense, and I just can't put my finger on why it just doesn't look fluid at all. But I think it comes down to which of the 
million opposites on Peru to Trevita's most comfortable setting. And if that happens to be Teister Horse, then so be it. I don't think he's very good either. I think, I don't, I'm not sure he's a liability, but he's extremely low ceiling, way lower than any of the other three opposites on, on the team. I just, I think Shawan got a look early in the season. You talked about him not being a, an early season guy. It didn't go very well. And Hyman's just like, screw it. Uh, this experiment is over. They brought in Masia Mujai, and they're, I think they're much more likely to throw him out there and see what happens than they're as likely to do with Shawan. I, I, I don't see it. Uh, it's not that it shouldn't happen, but I don't see it happening. I don't think there's any way. I mean, I'm, I, I also agree with you there. Like, I 100% obviously, you, I, you can tell that I want that to happen, and I think that should happen. But it's very clear that old man Trevizo over there is too busy about getting more neck tattoos than you know setting the ball. <laughs> Although I will say, I will say that I do think that Trevizo's game in the second leg, like Trevizo's ability to set a faster offense, a more varied offense, really allowed Perugia to to dominate. No, I think that, I don't think it was that big of a Trevizo difference. I think it was a serve and pass battle difference. Uh, Perugia did not serve well in the first match. They did in the second match. They didn't control the ball. Like Modena definitely out ball controlled them in match one. Uh, Perugia won that no, battle dude, in match check, two. Check I, the stats. Perugia outpassed Modena like by double. Like Perugia's over. Like Perugia's positive uh, passing rating was like fifty six percent, and they're they're like. Perfect rating was at 29, whereas Modenus was 33 and 16. So, like, it even, like, I, I wrote it in my, in my article, like, it even goes further on Trevita because they were passing dimes, and then, you know, they just weren't able to to convert on anything. Like, that's how bad Trevita was game one. Man, I, I, Trevita sucks. I think we're all, we all agree on that. <laughs> I don't understand passing stats. Like, the... Uh, I, I wish that here's the how whole I, world would bring, would, the, bring the three point scale. Thank you. Thank I, you. I the the whole it, world should do stats like American volleyball does. It's stupid. I fully agree. I'm hundred percent with you, with you on that. I will see it as a, a perfect, uh, as a uh, perfect execution, as they call it. I see that as a three pass and a positive pass is a two pass. That's the way I see it, but who knows? What, whatever. Who, uh, who knows really? Guys, guys, there's one last angle on the Shawan thing before we move on. What's that? Hear, hear me out. Hear me out here. Uh-oh. <laughs> Spring 2018, when Warsaw was making the run, right before Shawan pops off, Drake, a Canadian artist from Toronto, releases Scary Hours. It, oh, no. It, it, with God's plan on it. Shawan is a big Drake fan. In, in spring 2021, Drake releases Scary Hours 2. Shawan even actually posted about this it. This is the last, story. last night. Last night this happened. Last but, night. As we're filming this, I, I've got it up right so now. So now that Drake has released new music, that's... It's, it's literally three energy. songs. That, that might be enough. That might be enough, Rob. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually totally here for this storyline. I think that's amazing. <laughs> I'm just saying, if it happens this way, I think we know what caused it. It's, All right, it's, you heard it here first. It's Drake for sure. Undoubtedly. <laughs> Undoubtedly. Started from the bottom, and now Shawan is here. Hey, man. They're from, they're from the same city. You got to gotta, gotta represent the six. Have you ever been here, Rob? You ever been up to the no, six? I've, no, I've never been to Toronto. Uh, my Canadian experience is limited to Windsor, which I could see from, from my Ooh. Detroit apartment balcony. So Ooh. that's it. That's all I've got. Oh, no. Windsor, like Windsor, <laughs> Sorry that. Windsor, like every other Canadian town, the people are lovely, fantastic w people in Windsor. The, I everyone... played volleyball there once, and it was an absolute waste of my time. But at least I played volleyball in another country. That was cool. <laughs> really, I feel like Windsor yeah. actually has a has a has a pretty good scene. Um, it was co-ed. I hate co-ed volleyball. Oh, that's why. That's hard, cool. hard disagree. Yeah, you're Fair you're, enough, you're about the co-ed life, eh? Well, I'm, I'm I'm a short guy hitter, so of course I love Khaled. <laughs> that's that's fair, um, but uh, but yeah, Windsor not not really much offering much. I, I I love the people that I've met there, but the only time actually that's not that's not true. The only time I've been to Windsor, we beat the U.S. in 2015. So I take that back. I like Windsor. The only place I don't like is Edmonton. Ed, me and Edmonton don't get along. 
Well, I don't get along with either of you two Canadians, so there. <laughs> My national team is better than yours. Uh, we can talk about that later. Uh, back to Europe. I, I, we, we need to... <laughs> yeah, yeah. You need to co- Let, cover what's cover let, what's current right let's now. Let's talk about let's talk about well I mean we we pretty much talked about golden set number 1. Um they dominated. Week like week 1 was Modena at peak form and I think we talked about it a little bit in the, the chat how I find that like Modena was just working so hard for their points. You know, like they had to be so perfect, they had to execute perfectly to be able to compete with with uh with Perugia in in week 2 and they just they just didn't have the horses to do it. I agree with that. That's been the thing with them all year. Uh, it was it was the perfect storm in week one. Perugia did not play very well at all, and Mona had just about everything working. and And Micah Christensen said it in this post match interview in leg one. He was like, "Yeah, we know that next match next week is not going to be even close to the same as this." Uh, I, I Dan and I love how candid he is, and uh, he's absolutely right. Uh, there's. There, there was nothing about that second match that was going to be similar to the first. And sure enough, even Perugia at, I don't know, 80, 85% of their true peak maximum um, kind of mopped the floor with Modena. It was it was a little bit depressing. <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely was. Like, it was like a 15-5 golden set. Plotnitsky yeah. went on that nine-serve run. Leon had three blocks in it. Like it was, yeah. it, it, it was an utter domination. It was nasty. Yeah, it, it's. Uh, I felt bad for Micah Christensen. Like who, who do you set? You can't set anybody at that point. Like it, if 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 Ole is putting on that kind of pressure and you can't set middle and you're Modena and your options are Lavia, Petric, or Vittori, uh, nah, who do who who do you go to? And the yeah. answer was nobody. Yeah, pretty pretty much, and. Uh, Perugia moves on, which I mean, it was Dan's like Jersey lives to fight another day. Yeah, it was like like to me the idea of not having Perugia was like gonna be a crazy one. Like heading into that match, I was like, I really want to see how Modena acts in the first set because if they don't win the first set, to me, like it's done. And yep, yeah, Perugia, Perugia fought back. Unlike, they only need, Modena only needed to win two sets, which was the the story for most of this entire week was teams going in almost all of them that won the first matches knew they only had to win two sets and like, especially on the women's side. And then with, with Zenit Kazan, that became, that took a lot of the drama out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I I don't know how I feel, how, how I'm like back and forth on, on the, uh, on, on, on that side of things, whether it's like, whether just two sets should be enough because it's kind of anticlimactic. Like watching the Busto game yesterday, they win the the second set, and then it's just kind of over, you know. So it's you know at least in soccer because I know we were trying to emulate soccer because in volleyball we have no creativity and we're just like let's just do what the old whites over there do. They look like us, um, and uh, basically like they're like oh like we need an aggregate score so they do it with the sets which kind of makes sense but in soccer like if one team scores like you can still you could still conceivably score two goals in a minute and like change everything up you know so i i kind of hate how it just ends anticlimactically in right right in the middle of it well there's no clock in volleyball first of all so that's an element that's taken out of it and the the ranking points thing i think actually makes sense because i I do like it philosophically comes down to should a 3-2 win be worth the same as a 3-0 and 3-1 win? Um, and the arguments are for that is, yes, a win is a win. If you win the match, you win the match. But the argument for that is, against that is that if you lose 3-2, it should definitely be different than losing 3-0. Um, so that, that that idea has gone from like the very top levels all the way down in volleyball right now. And it's just the ranking points thing is, is how tournaments work. It's how all the FFVV tournaments work. It's how uh, Champions League breaks ties in the fourth round. I actually think it's a good way to do the the home and away in in the playoff phase. Uh, you get golden sets, which is sick. Golden sets are awesome, unless they're fifteen to five. And then, but I mean, sometimes when a team wins two sets, it's over in the second leg. It's just yeah. how it is. Dan, CEV side, what are your thoughts on that? What do people in the building say? Um, I mean. Yeah, it's pretty like set in stone as to what it is right now. I think there's been some proposals to change it, but uh, no, I think it, it, we just found that most of this, like a lot of the sets are ending three zero three one. So the ones that are able to push it to five should be rewarded in, in, in some respect. But I wonder, you guys, should we take a page out of Athletes Unlimited and just do a? Uh, 
aggregate points. Oh my god. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll touch on I'll touch on that later. But just on that point, real quick, I just want to kind of say, um, because um, in tennis, for example, like in in tennis, it's first one to to six games, but the extra set is like the seventh the seventh uh, game within the set, right? So like it'd be cool if we almost have have this because like right now as it is, you have to win three sets, and to me, it shouldn't be a difference of of like three one versus three two. But it's hard. It's tough. This is maybe a conversation conversation for another time. I do. Th- yeah, I think. I, I don't. I think in the current system, it's the best system we can have. I. That's what I was just about to say. Is that I don't think that there's a better idea out there right now than what it is. I actually like it. Uh, I think it's great because you want to play more volleyball. So the, the home and away thing is great because it's more than just one match. At which point, in a normal year, just the home team could just walk away with any match that you want to play. Uh, so more volleyball is cool. The home and away is cool. Uh, the golden set is cool. I'm because kind of okay with it how it is. I mean, the golden set produced what was... Like, to be honest, I think, Dan, you said it when you came on to the, the, the chat on, on Wednesday, that Perugia-Zaxa match might have been... Lube-Zaxa. Lube, Lube-Zaxa. Lube, I've made that mistake a few times. Um, might have been one of the best matches all season. It was awesome. It was awesome. I think the first Lube Zaxa match last week that Zaxa won three one. I said it on the European volleyball show. That was one of my fav- very favorite matches I had ever seen. And the the rematch this week was just so crazy because it was so close. What was it? 25, 23, 26, 24, 26, 24. Like I think every set was was deuce or extra points. And then Lube wins three zero goes to golden set and then it's just as close. I, I it was, it's just crazy to think that like cuz everybody's talking about Zaxa because they won. They won 16-14 in the golden set. But they lost the match three sets to none. <laughs> that that happened right before that. It, it's it's crazy had the margin that it came down to. And uh you I mean, I'm sure Lube is kind of pissed off. Although they dug their own hole by losing last week, but they they win a match 3-0 by a better set ratio. And then they lose a golden set on like a, a couple freak plays. They lose 16-14 and they're done for the tournament. The reigning champs and unfortunately my pick to win the event uh, are, are out of here. They're, all they have to play for now is Scudetto. So crazy, crazy, crazy match. Sorry, Rob, you, you, you stuck with your pick. I did. You should have uh, gotten that when you could. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm going to go down with the ship. Uh, I, I don't feel bad about that, but. It's funny because as much as I wanted my pick to hold up, I was actually kind of rooting for Zaxa. I just loved the storyline, and I'm just such a huge fan of watching them play that uh, given the draw that they got in the playoffs, the fact that they have been able to even get to where they are now to play Zenit Kazan in the semis is amazing. And now, like we've, like a lot of us are saying in the chat, I mean, Zaxa Zenit Kazan is probably a better matchup for Zaxa than even Lube was. I think... It's very, very possible that Zaxa goes to the finals, and it's it's very, very possible that they win this tournament. I didn't think that they would be able to get through all of the crazy gauntlet they have, but I think their biggest hurdle is now behind them. I, I honestly, I agree. I think that honestly, Zaxa, to me as a team, they were just as good as the as the any other ones. But I didn't know if individually those players could play like Slika, Semenya, Kazmarek. Like that, that that trio of outsides just doesn't have the pedigree of uh, Leal Wantarena, even Richlickly, which we we all know how you feel about him and uh, his hair. Um, in the last oh, game. The hair. oh, in, oh I already uh, forgot. Why did you have to remind me? In the last game. Um, but man, like those three guys came to play and they're straight up ballers. Like for me, if there was a volleyball video game right now, like each each of them would be getting a score update. You know, like each of them would be getting some more skill points because my level like of respect that. for them is way higher. Kashmarek, I like that. I think Kashmarek, and and I was saying it, and I know you don't like this, but I would pick him to be the starting opposite for Poland in in the play in in the Olympics this year. R- seriously, like I thought he was so good, so impressive, and I mean we can he talk. He was great. You know, well, but, let's talk about that later. Yeah. Uh, you're you're not kidding though. Uh, Shlivka, Semenyuk, Kajmerik are officially officially at the echelon where they can play with the big boys, and you could even call them the big boys themselves. Uh, they are are reaching that elite tier as individuals and as as a group. That's 
that's a really good pin hitter trio in the world of club right now. It's really, really good. Yeah. And- yeah. So many, it's going to be really tough to uh, leave off the national team roster. If it comes to that this summer. And really- you were talking about Split catch Merrick, too. catch Merrick over, over Bartosz Kurek, but you know, do you think you have to consider maybe a Semenya standing beside Wilfredo Leon or Sifka standing behind beside Wilfredo Leon on the on the outside hitter position? I mean, I would I would f- completely feel comfortable. With it. I honestly, I'm kind of feeling the the vibe that you brought yesterday too. We we're talking about putting Schliefka, depending on the matchup with the team, putting Schliefka on the right side and letting him pass and just letting Leon bang away from I the pipe and, months and, ago. And, and the left side. And I I'm, I'm all for that. that. Watching Sleeka's blocking too, it's so good. And that like that's Zax's blocking is so disciplined. You don't have guys flailing. Most of the guys like they don't really swing block. They just kind of go up and down. Like Salika's like his push and his pressure. Like he goes straight up and he's pushing like pits over, like fully, fully extended over. Well, so many of two. And then when they drop Tony Udi out of the block, which the, I can't believe they're able to get away with that against a team like Lube. It's insane that a literally two two blockers for the entire front of the net are able to stop a, a team with that much firepower and it it's it comes from lots of areas uh but the the discipline and just the way that that team has figured out what works for them is so rare for a club team to have that such that strong identity and team chemistry and all that like Dan and I have talked about this on our show, how how cool it is to see a club team kind of pull off that vibe we see it with national teams a lot because they're more consistent rosters over the years but Zaxa, man, they're just so much fun to watch. And even if, even though, like I said, my pick has been defeated for this tournament, I'm still stoked. I'm, I'm really excited that that Zaxa is where they are. I think it's good for the game. Can I, can I give my one point of underrated Please. Zaxa analysis that I don't think I've heard anyone talk about? Benjamin Taniuti's serve, really effective, in my opinion. He was the leading server in this game in terms of uh, number of serves in this one, 21 serves, uh, most on the team. And, you know, I, I felt like he was really putting uh, the team, the opponent, out of out of uh, their their offense and leading to some very good blocking opportunities. Obviously, it's a good thing that Tony Udi's not in the front court because that's going <laughs> to affect the block a lot. But, you know, he's, so it's two things. He's not in the front court blocking and he's back at the service line throwing some very deceptive Serves. He's, he has a really weird one. I don't know if there's another player who serves exactly like him. Yeah, he contacts it really low, like the opposite of what most float servers are trying to do right now, where they have kind of have that downward trajectory. And he's just picking a a three by three square foot spot on the court and just hit it with his float serve. He's really accurate. Uh, that, that's a great point, Dan. I didn't know that he was the like he had hit the most service attempts. And what that means yeah. is that Saxa is scoring points in his service rotation. And you gotta score points on serve if you're gonna win volleyball matches. So. And of course, no no errors with this float serve as well. See, this is that this helps. is this is exactly why I wish we started passing on a three scale because I'd love to be like be able to look up and be like, oh, this team like Lube passed a two point one average on Toniuti serve during this game, you know, like, and you know, like I I want that to be a stat that I know for you know from a team like i like i want to be able to to know like not only how many he like made and how many missed but like what's the average pressure he's putting on to that team you know like that's that's a stat that i would love to be able to have um you know in a in a stat sheet i agree that's how they should do passing stats but i mean a number of service attempts uh it's a huge indicator absolutely yeah it's, you, you can draw some pretty clear conclusions from that dan i'm glad you brought that up also, he's really good uh, back row defense, but I think we already knew that one. I think we already knew that. The whole team, dude, Pavel Zatorski, like, are you serious? That, that like, one-armed stab that he made in left back looks so Stealing casual. Souls, like... My God. <laughs> just just perfect. Just, yeah, just, like, chef's kiss. Just <laughs> just perfect. Just, oh, my God. Uh, I, I almost hate to say this, but is he the second best libero in the world right now? Is he better than Eric Shoji? Because I think he might be. Yeah, I think so. Like I I I, yes. I, I think I'm gonna that, say yes as well. I think you can even make you can make uh, arguments. Don't, don't that, do it, Evan. Don't do it. Make, don't make the argument. Don't, don't even think about it. You can make arguments that he's better no, than Rubenikov, especially no, in serve receive. No, you can't. You can't. 
just I'm just I'm just saying, you know, he plays he plays a different style than Grabenikov and he's just he's very very solid. His reads are so good. He has minimal movement to his game. Like I I love watching Zatorski because you don't notice Zatorski. Like he does all of the little things really 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 good. You know, Grabenikov gets hit like no one gets hit by the ball like <laughs> Grabenikov. I will stand by that. Yeah, well, yeah, those, those two Leon bombs that he dug last week in the one rally is is, is why Grabenikov is the best mm-hmm. libero in the world right there because nobody else can make those plays, and that changed the match. Nobody else can do that, and he he will forever as long as he is actively playing volleyball. He's the best in the world, in my opinion. I don't think he can be dethroned, but uh, Zatorski. At least right now, like I haven't watched a lot of Falkel matches this year with Eric Shoji. Um, it, it may it, we may have to just get back to national team season where I can really start watching him again. But uh, it's hard to pick against Zatorski right now for number two. I don't know. Yeah, I was doing a video, or I'm working on a video right now, like the Russian All Stars, and Shoji didn't make my list because this 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 passing stats are not the greatest. I have to say in Russia, not bad by any means, but. Who uh, who's your libero? Is it Golubev or someone else or Kermanian or Golubev? Yeah, Golubev is a monster. That uh, really... that VNL <laughs> finals that Dan, you and I were at in Chicago. Like the, I think the reason why Russia won that tournament is because of how well Golubev passed the ball against the U.S. in the finals. He was money. He was absorbing yeah. just bombs and and putting him right on the setter's he, head. He's gotten very little attention, obviously, because of Alexander uh, Alexei Verbov. But I think people are going to start, especially because we haven't had a Russian real like national team season yet that much since uh, Verbov retired. But now, definitely when we have Vienna this year and World Championships, Olympics and stuff, people are going to start to know his name a lot more. I agree. I think he's really good. So, th- yeah, that's interesting that his, his numbers are better than Shoji's this year. Monty wants to know what you guys think of Balasso. Where do you rank Balasso? I think the way he got blown up there, especially by Kokonovsky in that that golden oh, set, that that <laughs> like was in, in, the, in the same way that the the three outsides for Zaxa got bumped up, Balasso. I'm gonna notch you down a little bit because there's that, no way, oh. there's no way that you should be getting ace like that. And it wasn't, it wasn't, a, it was a good serve, but it wasn't, you know, no, wasn't the, a the only thing about that serve is that it wasn't missed into the net or out of bounds. That is the only credit that you can give Kokonovsky because Straight his up. serve was awful that game awful uh but Belasso, that, that ball was was centimeters off of his off of his left left arm and his platform that that is an unforgivable mistake if you think you're going to be a top level libero that to shank that ball the, the one that Juan Torreira got aced on in the end was at least a little bit more difficult of a serve he had to reach down into his right and um kind of went off his wrist bone i think straight into the floor rather than off the flat part of his platform so that one was that first, one was kind of weak too though it, it was pretty weak. Yeah, Kashmirik won the match on an ace, but that was a very passable ball. Uh, the Blossa one was worse. That, that was that was <laughs> was really bad. Yeah. So, uh, who's who's the best Italian-born libero, right? In your opinion, is it Kalachi? Kalachi, Kalachi. I think it's Kalachi. It's got to be Kalachi. Yeah, probably Kalachi. But my most underrated Italian libero, who no one ever talks about, Domenico Cavaccini. He'll always be my favorite uh, Italian libero. Where's who's he play uh, for? <laughs> um, I think he plays uh, in the, in the second division this year. Oh my so, god! Damn, um, yeah. please. <laughs> uh, well, he was he was one of the leading like reception stats guys for for quite a while. Um, um, in, in the the in chat the, the chat is bringing up um, Cavaccini plays for Cisterna. Um, and then what about Rossini? Uh, okay. Toto Rossini. Uh, Rossini is fine. He's had a good year for Moda. Right. But no, not not about it. All right then. It's fine. He's he's fine. Uh, it seems like yeah, the chat. Like it seems like the chat. Ch- You're just pulling out like Italian. Like I feel like no one watches. Um, no one watches B level Italian volleyball <laughs> other than Dan. You know? Yeah, Dan chirps me for watching Czech League volleyball, but he's out here. Why watching... do you watch Czech? I mean, I have Guys, friends Pe- that play. Pe- is the libero on Milano, which has Yuki Ishikawa and Steven Marr, their two favorite players. Pesaresi's fine. Fine. That's <laughs> Rob's. Fine. Rob, uh, uh, yeah, he's fine. Yeah, he's, he's okay. <laughs> I don't have any, anything more to say about him. So uh, I don't know if we have anything else to say about Lube Zoxo before we move on from that. But uh, that was, as far as golden sets go, 
Uh, that's as good as it gets right there. Yeah. Especially, much. yeah, again, after Zox, Zoxa loses 3 nothing and then they win the Golden Set 16-14. That was, that was sick. The, the, the celebration was unreal from the team, too. Yeah. It, could you imagine if there had been fans there? Oh, my God. Especially that, that game was Dude. in Zox or in <sighs> Kessergen, whatever. Uh, uh, oh, that would have been just so electric. That would have been like an all-time scene. Even like the, in the, Modena, the amount the, of noise. Imagine oh. the Modena game in week one too. How yeah, crazy. when Jen, when Jenia dug those two balls in Modena, could you imagine if that like, if Tommy if, if our boy Tommy we, had been we there? We wouldn't like, have heard. On. We wouldn't have heard from Tommy on the chat for like days. He, would, he just would have been <laughs> MIA. <laughs> yeah, ever. By the way, like Dan and I can't see Twitch chat, but you can. So if if the guys are in there and they're chirping, then. Uh, it's it's on you. I, 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 yeah, I have it. I have it, I have it here as well. Yeah. And, oh, you and, do. Okay. Anything that that's coming up, I mean, it's it's it looks like the, basically they just took the Discord chat to the Twitch. <laughs> it's the usual <laughs> Which, suspects. It was, it's it's the usual suspects. I mean, yeah. Love I, you guys. <laughs> so it's we're 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 just building from the from the inside out. I mean, this this will go on the on the volleyball source channel. So once again, if anyone wants to come join our Discord, it's free. Um, it'll be in the show notes at the at the bottom. It's on it's on the website. Just come in, click that link, join. Um, it's and, lit. And then start using the spicy emoji because oh, uh, that's that's strictly. what we do. All right, uh, Zenit Kazan, Skra Belkatov. Uh, thoughts? Skra took the first. It looked like it might be happening briefly, and then it wasn't happening anymore. Scraw's got, Scraw's got a lot of gusto, you know. Like they've done this in a lot of matches this year, in big matches where they come out of the 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 gate just flying, and then they they can't keep keep up with it. And the reality is, is I think we've talked about it a lot, is that they need a new right side. You know, Petkovic is is not good enough, and Lomach is just is just very average. You know, if they had if they had a, a setter who was a step up they could make that squad work but with how average low match has been this year and how streaky and unreliable Petkovic is there's just no matter how good about and, and Sander are going to be doing there's just they're, they're just not a complete team at the moment those are very good adjectives you just used uh, mm-hmm. I, th- I think well match is average I think Petkovic is streaky and unreliable I think those are very very good descriptors uh yeah the, the rumor is that they're getting alexander atanasievich next year that would be an upgrade we think but we don't really know what to expect from atanasievich these days these days definitely a gamble but the yeah, setters i mean Wolmach doesn't do doesn't jump off the page with anything he does he doesn't block sometimes sometimes he pulls off and doesn't block like the same way tony Udi does uh, he doesn't. Is, isn't he like six four as well? He, no, he's not that big. He, he's okay, he okay. can't be can't be taller than six two. But like, still, uh, he doesn't make a difference blocking. He doesn't make a difference serving. I don't I don't get the impression that he makes a difference in backcourt defense. And then the offense that he sets is is it's fine, I guess. So yeah, I think they they need a little bit of an upgrade there. And I mean, Polish national team, same problem. I think everybody at the center position right now is just a little bit too average. I think that's pretty clearly their biggest weakness. Well, yeah, I mean, a lot of people say Fabian Drisha is the answer. No, he's not. I think, he's, I think it's not. He's yeah. marginally better than Womach, and I think that's about it. Is Drisha playing in Asia this year somewhere? Where is he? No, he's playing no, for he's Soviet. Soviet. See, Drisha to me, he's, Why didn't I know that? he's very Luciano De Cecco esque. Um, no, he's not. It, Nobody is Luciano De Cecco esque. What are you talking about? Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Let me <laughs> let me back this up here. In the terms of the way he approaches the game, he is more of an art setter as opposed to like a, a like a a system setter. You know, he's got very very good hands. He gets to the ball late. He's lazy. He's able to find his hitters, but he's a little bit streaky sometimes because he relies on his skill and like his ability as opposed to, you know playing volleyball sometimes you know you know what i mean like we're like disciplined and fundamentals yeah okay. but he also isn't as good and like i'm not at all making the same comparison like he's very much a little version of um of de like he wishes he could be de but he isn't you know and then you know and th- that's always my like like Druska can make some absolutely 
insane sets sometimes. And sometimes he can like he can make those highlight plays. But then there's other times where just like you know, the the ball is a little bit off and he's getting there late and he's getting there with his hands and he's turning and just chucking and it's 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 not great. Right? So that's why like you know, he's definitely a poor man's Decheco. Okay, I don't I hate see, that. I can see. That's a good justification. Yeah. I don't I agree. I don't I don't but, hate that. But, but for Kazan versus Belzadov, I mean, the thing is, if one hitter is is hitting poorly, maybe that's their fault. If every pin hitter is hitting poorly, that's usually the setter's fault. And in this one, uh, 23 for 69, the three outside hitters as combined. In, oh, my God. That is awful. Hit, wow. Attack percentage, not efficiency. Right. So, so 33, 33% kill rate for pins. That's yeah. awful. I don't, really, really I don't think I've seen an attack rate that bad of like all Ouch. of all season, all of the all of the score sheets I've watched. I've that's at just it. pins. Like if you include middles, I'm sure it goes up. But yeah, I, but guess you're, I guess that's right. Yeah, close, close, three for seven. Ouch. Still not great. Huber five for seven is alright. Where's Beniak on here? Ouch. Uh, six for ten, Beniak, but still not like even when you include those guys, you still would not get to fifty. For sure. No. Wow. That that is. Wow. You're not kidding. It's it's, it's the yeah. drop. It's. The, I think we should name this the, the. I don't know. The theorem of Dragan Travica or something. That's like if if all the setters or if if one hitter is playing badly, that's on them. If all the hitters are playing badly, you you replace the setter. You can blame them. the setter in that point. Oh, 100. percent And um, that is the the Dragan Travica Perugia problem this year, without question. Even if like if you can't get Wilfredo Leon to. 50% kill rate, not even 50% efficiency, then you don't deserve a spot on the court. Yeah. It was... Um... Oh, damn. I was trying to see if we could get uh, TJ TJ Sander. Do you know who's the... He's the uh, setter, one of the setters for Team Canada. He's currently up up you north get, in Canada. You gotta, you gotta be careful because T- there's TJ Sanders. Yes. And there's Taylor Sander. Yeah, TJ uh, Sanders. So... I know the difference, but it, it's it's very important that we get that clear. Oh uh, yeah, TJ Sanders is, is the man. I love his game. Yeah. I wish that he were healthy for your sakes. Yeah, he is currently uh, currently up north, and I was trying to convince him to come on the. I was like, let's do a podcast, and I was going to be like, yo, just come join, hop on with us. Let's like, come chill. And he's like, I'd love That'd to, but the Wi-Fi couldn't take it. He's like up. He's in like up north. In, in the territories or he's like northern quebec like if he's saying a, there's a blizzard it's probably like minus 40 to 5 degrees celsius and you know there's probably like three feet of snow or four or five feet so of he's snow so he's he's up there he's way up there gotcha yeah um sorry what were we talking about i got distracted there by uh by tj we were we were ripping on uh scrub elkatov's offense i mean zenit kazan has a lot to do with that their strengths are Serving hard, They're a good blocking team, They're and really good being a very, teams. very good blocking team. So uh, they they looked they looked comfortable. I, I think them versus Zox is going to be a really good matchup. Uh, ben Norris was pretty good. Ingapeth was good. Mikhailov is the man, and everyone else was fine. So uh, I don't have that much more to say about that. Really, I think the final score was three two, but after Kazan went up two one, Scott won the first. Kazan won sets two and three, and then it was over. Like we said, all they need to do is win two sets. So I think the bench got put in. They got Kazan got stomped in set four, and mm-hmm. nobody just nobody cared at that point. I definitely stopped watching after set three. Yeah, no, same. Um, moving on to the last quarterfinal, Trento against Berlin. This one was never really. Unf- this was the one that I called for it to be a golden set because I believed that Ben Patch could, you know, come out with with something, and uh, it just never happened. Oh, Everett, you you poor misguided child. Uh, I've I've watched Ben Patch play for too long to have had that amount of faith. Ouch! Ouch! Ouch. Like the the Canadian guy has more faith in your guy than the, than the American does. It's based on sample size, man. I, like it's it really it wasn't Ben Patch's fault that they lost this match. They just had absolutely no way of scoring points on serve. They couldn't block anybody. Uh, they couldn't serve hard enough to take Trentino out of system, and that was it. Uh, pretty much at every single position, Trentino is just better 
than Berlin. I'm trying to think of if there are any exceptions to that. And they, they execute. And like, I really don't think there are. Like Trentino and and Zaxa are, in my eyes, the teams that execute at the highest level in the world. And they're, Trentino is a very good execution team. Like, they, they just take care of the little details. Um, and that's why it's... it's the, like, the next round is going to be a battle. It's going to be like this. We've got two very, very good semifinals. Uh, yeah, because like Perugia... Side. Perugia played Trentino in the semifinals of the Italian Cup. Mm -hmm. And on Dan and I's show, I actually picked Trentino to win that match. And they got destroyed. Like Perugia like rolled over them 3-0. Like the, the key to beating Trentino is to, is taking them out of their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Like that's I mean, that's the case with all volleyball teams, but especially Trentino. If you can't put them under any pressure, like Berlin was completely unable to do, then then you just can't stop them. Uh, Namir is too good. Uh, you you have to make Namir hit like I don't know 300 or less efficiency on very high volume. You got to take Trentino really far out of system to make them vulnerable. And also you have to hope that either Lucarelli or Dick Coy has a bad game. And it seems like every single game these days, Dick Coy goes to the bench midway through set one, and Mikuleto comes in and plays better. Just start uh, Mikuleto already. That's <laughs> what I've been saying. It's what I've been saying for months. Uh, but Rossini has been good. Uh, Pradashan has been good. Lisa Notch has been maybe a little bit below his normal like world beating status but he's been fine uh gianelli's great really yeah a, a team is gonna have to make Trentino really uncomfortable in order to beat him and uh if there's one team that can be weird enough to make them uncomfortable uh, i think perugia might be that team so semis are gonna be fun yeah i i think so too i think um Trentino's ability to a take care of the details, but like you said, like you have to put them way far out of out of system to put put them out, out outside of their comfort zone. And I mean, let's be honest though, Trentino was used to playing outside their comfort zone. They've done it this year. They played without a setter. They had Namir do that, and that's what's changed their season, right? So well said. For, for well them, said. it's 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 that battle tested team early in the season a little bit like busto like busto on the women's side had a terrible start to the season and now they've won 14 in a row and they've beat the only team in the basically the only teams they haven't beat are back of bank over they're playing next and conigliano you know they beat navarra they beat all the other teams in in um in, in the italian women's league so they the i think trentino believes in themselves past just by past being, you know, like we're all good volleyball players. I think they believe in themselves as a team. And I think Trentino believes themselves as, as a team. And I think Zaxa believes in, uh, in themselves as a team, especially after the way that, you know, that they, they obviously had to come together to beat Lube. And I think that's two very dangerous places for both of those teams to be in. I'm on, I'm on board. I'm on board with that take. Uh, I don't know. I think the matchup with Peru just, uh, we already saw it. The last couple of games, it's really tough for Trentino because, yeah, Perugia is one of the few teams that can take them out of their execution, out of their system offense, and they're not the strongest um, out of system team, at least at this level. And, and I don't know. I, I, do, I don't know about the comparison with Busto, though, ever, because Trentino, we all thought was going to be really good at the start of the season. Like, right. I remember when the Lucarelli signing happened, it was like, damn, like Trentino could be like the best team in Italy. Um, and when they signed Pedrash in as well. Uh, Busto, I, I don't know. I'm still maybe I'm still not 100 percent sold on them, but uh, I feel like I we we're expecting them, them to be a mid two team. And I know that's I know that's Alexa Grace Lander, and she's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, like the fact that she's not getting MVPs, this is the one of the things that's getting me the most heated right now. Like the past three games that she's played in Italy, she scored 20 plus points, and none of them like she's she's scoring 20 plus points, passing over 50 percent of the balls, and she's not getting MVPs. I don't understand it. They're yeah. just being like, oh yeah, one middle. Cool. You went six for nine. MVP awards are arbitrary. I, I don't like them. It's such At least like the way the Europe does them. No, I, I really like the MVP awards. Uh, um, I, I think it's something that North American sports should 100% incorporate. I, I, I agree with that. With the Raptors playing doesn't. the Lakers, like Kyle Lowry like had a really good game. Boom, let's give Kyle Lowry the yeah, MVP. Yeah, my league little... does them. I, but, uh, yeah, exactly. We choose them by like the actual best player that match. Like we wouldn't overlook a performance like Alexa Grace. Anyway, uh, uh, Dan, what do you think about the comparison from Busto to Vibo Valencia? 
uh, boost just yes, in terms of ex, be ex, be ex, expectations no. at the beginning of the season. Now, Busto is playing better now than Vibo is. They're reaching higher heights than Vibo can possibly because they're not in Champions League. Busto in, in Champions League semifinals is a ridiculous Cinderella story. No, it's better not. than anything. Busto, bu- yes, okay. yes, it is. No, Busto is. Are you a kidding cat. me? Busto Top is a, four is... in all of Europe. But like, that no, that, it, that is ha- first an of all, all-time Cinderella story. No, it's happened before for them. They've been to that. They've been to that spot before. Busto's a good team. Like this is like Busto had a lot. Like I'm pulling up their volley box. Like last year, last year they finished second in the Italian Cup, and. Like the yes, year before, like 2019, they, they, lost. they won the, the the CEV Cup. Like 2019, they were fifth in in the. You know, they're not Vibo who won five years. That's a ridiculous comparison. Like Vibo went from the oh, basement, like year. a team, a team like being in the basement to being one of the top teams in the league. That's huge. But Busto's I don't think like a that's team that ridiculous like, at all. Like Busto's a team that plays Champions League. You know, maybe not on a regular basis, but is in European competitions on the regular basis. Like that's not it's not a a, a relegation level team. Now, no, Tom, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm but talking this year, this year that they they Tom, had Tommy is agreeing similar with, levels of expectations. Tommy is is agreeing with me in the Twitch in 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 the chat right now. I mean, they they've lost like an uh, all star team of players though. They're like lost like more than a level players with Britt Herbots right. and they Haley ex- Washington. They develop Carcelo. good players and then immediately lose them. Especially like, I feel okay. Maybe this is give it like a little controversial, but I feel like the reason why they were good last year was like mostly because of Britt Herberts and her like breakout season from All Star to like MVP level player. I don't know. And then losing her was, was killer. Man, was, this current team with with Britt Herberts though would be would be ridiculous. I, I think I liked the Busto beat Navarre the other week just because of that individual storyline. I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, the it's. There's no like perfect one to one comparison between Busto and any of the men's teams. They've got Trentino elements, they've got Vibo elements, uh, but they they're similar to Trentino in that they've got a chance to go to the goddamn Champions League finals of all things. Like, which I would not have picked that. I obviously wouldn't have picked that for Busto. I wouldn't have picked it for Trentino either. I, even preseason when when we thought that they were going to be really good, I still wouldn't have picked that, especially because we knew that they were going to have to go through like the qualifying levels of champions so you can even get to fourth round so i'm i'm just gonna say here from the chat from monty johnson busto is a woman's italian big four in my opinion they lost a lot of great players but it's not like the replacements are bad and they side stefanovic and mingardi who are among the their best in italy's in their role and gray as well who was a top top scorer last year for for scandici so i'm just saying that like that Vibo Valencia to Busto comparison, like, like to me, like Busto is more along the lines of a Trentino or a Scraw, like a, a team, a, a, a top four team, a top four team that's not having as good of a season this year. Maybe the Scraw comparison is good, actually. That, that could be good. Um, it's a team that has really good players, but also lacking. Some, some yeah, I, I could see that. I, could see I that. mean, I'm gonna re- I'm gonna remind you that Busto's beaten every single team ahead of him in the standings, other than uh, Egonu, or not Egonu. Well, I mean, it's pretty much is Egonu, but okay. uh, other than <laughs> other than Canigliano, right? Canigliano. But the know, Monty but, Johnson uh, Busto equals Trento. If comparisons have to be made, thank you very much. I am vindicated. What's next? <laughs> it's, at least, it's not like they're Italians and they follow the league really closely or anything. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, I, I don't value that, their opinions at all. No, ridiculous. Uh, the Vakif Bank <laughs> match of those is going to be extremely Oof, spicy. Vakif Bank absolutely <laughs> punched Police in the face like repeatedly. Dude, that, like, that was the most lopsided like Champions League playoff matchup I may have ever seen. It was it was ugh, ouch. It, it it really showed to me how like the way that Reshov Reshov and um, the Kemic Police did at the Champions League really showed how Poland is not it's not there yet. Like the the Torin Liga is not at the level of Italy. They're not at the level of of Turkey. Yeah, I could have told you that. Uh, but yeah, I was ex- I was hoping for something a little bit better out of Polisa. They could have at least taken the set. Well, no, I I shouldn't expect them to be able to beat Bakif Bank. 
but uh, it, it would have been nice for it to be, have been a little more competitive. Uh, but Vaki Bank looks looks sick. They look so good right, right now. Guys, I, I thought of this in the shower this morning, but you know, oh, Isabel Hack, one of the best uh, offices in the world. I think Giovanni Guidetti on the last podcast said she was top three. I think you guys can guess who the other two are. But considering she's just such a big part of Vakif Bank, I think we should start calling them Hawk of Bank. <laughs> <laughs> the new uh, the, the team. I'm going to coin it. If Isabel Hawk winning MVP for Vakif Bank in the finals, Hawk of Bank is simple. Are we allowed to like disconnect him from the podcast ever? Can we like, kick him <laughs> off the stream or? Yeah, <laughs> and we'll see what happens next week of the the European volleyball podcast. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I I, sh- I shouldn't tempt fate like that. Uh, actually, I, I'm I'm kind of in on on the pun. I'm I'm here for it. <laughs> Tom, Tommy, I don't like where you're going with that one. <laughs> one one thing to note, like Vakif Bank has Vakif Bank. has Vakif Bank. Get out of here, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Vakif Bank has like a lot of their players signed for next year. Eh? Or five players signed for next year. Gunes, Akman, Barch, Gumarez, and Osbe. I mean, what are they, whatever they have going on right now is uh, is working, but Isabel Hawk is, is definitely the big one there. Yeah, she is insane. So yeah, it's 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 a heat check for both teams, Busto and Hockif Bank. Hockif Bank. <laughs> See, you're good at uh, Damn it, Dan. You, 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 to... you got me. Damn it. <laughs> I can't believe it. <laughs> Um, yeah, B- Busto's on the run of a lifetime. Uh, Vakif Bank is has been pretty much untouchable lately. It's it's a it's unstoppable force versus, versus immovable object sort of matchup. Mm-hmm. It's cool. And then the other side is just as sick. Like Novara and Canigliano. Like come on, that, that's that's, that's going to have it all. I wish it was more than a two match series. It's like an Italian men's playoffs kind of series. Yeah, I, and I a Champions League 2019 finals rematch. That is correct. I forgot about that. I I really like watching Navarro play. And it and it really comes down to Haley Washington and Mikey Hancock. Who actually no, but Britt Harbots too. They like the entire squad is like that you could tell that they have fun together. You can tell that they have a good vibe together. They're they're yeah. very offensively minded and they're very like they run such a high powered offense and I love wa- I love watching it and I, I love watching Micah Hancock set. Like, I've been watching Micah Hancock and Haley Washington for longer than any of you combined because I saw them in real life play both as freshmen in college uh, in my gym at Purdue, and they were disgusting then, and they're disgusting now. Uh, they're great friends on and off the court, obviously. Uh, Washington on the slide is a sick run. Um, but I talked about Hancock serving on the last European volleyball show, and – that's a, a weapon unlike anything else in the women's game in the world. It is just insane how her volume of aces, the pressure she puts on at minimal error sacrificing. It's 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 unbelievable. We just got a Bozzetti as Draymond Green uh, <laughs> reference. Elaborate. Elaborate. I, I, it was in the stat. I, was, I need I need a little doing, bit more. Doing all the garbage on the team, that. defense and yeah. second second touches. So, I mean, know. she is kind of a grinded out kind of player. She's a grinder. I, I could say she that. was sick in the first match against uh, whoever it was that they played. I, I already forgot who they were able to beat so easily. Uh, Fenerbahce. Uh, yeah, the, the she MVP'd that match because she had like twenty two points on and scored a, in a million different ways. You know what? I don't hate that Draymond Green comparison. I'll, as a player, I hate Draymond Green as a person. I think he's an asshole, but uh, I, I don't have any reason to think that about Bassetti, but maybe, maybe he's onto something with the yeah, play style. I, I, I kind of agree, you know, that, that workman's attitude where, you know, they they have that, like, because obviously, like, that team is going to key in on Britt Herbots and, and on Haley Washington and stuff like that. And so... Smarzek, too, is playing really well right now. Actually, yeah, I, I actually always forget about Smarzek, and Smarzek's a beast. She's a little bit scary. She's awesome. Yeah, she's, she's scary. She, 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 she's 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 a, she's a little bit scary, but in in situations, she's the nicest person in real life, though. Oh, is I have she? To say. No, but awesome. So super, super nice. Really, really pleasant. It's it seems I I have a vibe that like Polish Polish women are all very nice. Like it it, it seems yeah. like I've I've never dealt in drastic with comparison to the men. <laughs> <laughs> interesting interesting that's, 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 that's i have a few spicy. stories that maybe, um, in this podcast but yeah those are offline stories but those are those yes. are offline stories those are viable source after dark podcast stories um oh man 
that 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 needs to happen sometime but yeah as as for Bazzetti, like i i agree like she has that ability to like just like i'm gonna pass well i'm gonna play good defense i'm gonna set a good block i'm gonna do all of the little like, volleyball things that are, are are need to be done for my team to win but hey if other guys aren't gonna if the other players in the team aren't gonna be able to get the job done give me the ball and i'm gonna put it away you know that's that's like the salt of the earth type of player that that every coach loves yeah dude navarro is sick they shut down a pretty good Fenerbahce team by limiting their options to pretty much just Melissa Vargas. And they figured out how to slow her down enough to, to fire with fire back with all their, their weapons. It was, it was a, a, a pretty convincing just the way that they handled the matchup. Uh, but now Canegliano is like built a little bit similarly to Fenerbahce, but ever so slightly better at every single position. <laughs> Uh, so there, there's a reason why they've won 51, 52 matches in a row. I don't yeah, remember. Yeah, 50, 50 plus matches in a row for for uh, completely, at least ridic- a completely ridiculous and then they want number. One. Yeah, I'm. I mean, yeah, I. Uh, it's hard to pick. Like, if I was to pick any team to beat Canigliano, I'd want it to be Navarra. Um, but it's it's hard to pick against. Like, but at, this, at the same time, it was also hard to to pick against uh lube they've been they've been undefeated since two th- or late 2019 no nobody was nobody really has ever been undefeated like canigliano on the men's side or anywhere else that that kind of a run except for maybe zen kazan and their unbeatable days that that's like an unforeseen run that just doesn't happen yeah it, it really it in it was interesting to watch because um i think maybe the most passionate and uh overbearing fans on youtube comment sections after the turkish people are the serbians <laughs> oh. <laughs> with them declaring tiana boscovich the best player in the world and i think yesterday it really showed how you know uh maybe she wasn't at the same level as agono because she wasn't able to to carry exabashi she was doing a she was doing a good job but the rest of Ikshasi Bassi is not even close to as good as the rest of Canigliano. We've got to talk about that. Uh, Dan agrees with me. Facts. It's Facts. not even close, not even close, that the rest of Canigliano is so much better than the rest of Ikshasi Bassi. It's not even close. Um, we, I, I actually give Boscovich all the credit in the world because in the first leg against Busto, they were missing three other starters to COVID protocol, and they set... Boscovich every single ball and everyone in the gym knew it and she still hit like 400 it was outrageous so it doesn't matter uh she's amazing she is very very good is she the best player in the world probably not uh is she the most important to her club team right now I think Dan made this argument a couple weeks ago mm. um probably she she very well may be the most important on the women's side the most important player to a given team I'm, I'm I'm here I, for this take I like that I would argue that Dan argued that first he gets the credit for for that take but uh, Boscovich yeah. is thick. She is the she is the 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 favorite of many a YouTube chat. That's definitely uh, guys. Wait 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 till wait till the national team season this summer. Then we're all gonna be like, damn, can't believe we didn't think Boscovich was the best in the world. Like she's gonna win MVP of the Olympics, like MVP VNL, MVP or European Championships, Triple Crown. She's she's the real deal. And that's, the fact that's that she speaks so well when it chats about see, like that they need to upgrade their setter next year. For like sure, it, for sure. Compared to the other top teams, it's 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 like Perugia and Dragon Trevizo. Like, <laughs> like they just got lost out in like the the domestic setter sweepstakes, especially when Yansu Osbe is sitting on the bench for Vakif Bank. Like you you like you have to go and grab like <laughs> when you have one of your national team setters sitting on it's the bench. Like Dmitry club. Kovalev sitting on the bench for Zenit Saint Petersburg. Yeah, except Dmitry Kovalev is better. Obviously, oh, I'm a huge Yancey fan. Oh, damn. Uh, she, she's, she's really good. I honestly think she could be starting uh, maybe even over Nas this summer. Maybe. Uh, yeah, she, she needs to be somewhere in club where she can start. That That's a exactly. no-brainer. That's a no-brainer. I mean, you're, you're sitting behind Maya. That You're not going anywhere there. But you could go make Shashi Basi a little bit better. I, I, I like that take. That That makes sense to me. By the way, it's funny. Maya Njenovic, after she won MVP in that match, was like, "Well, Oz, Oz, really? Oz, okay, sure." <laughs> Oz Bay is already signed to Vakif Bank for next season, and Maya isn't. Yes, 
maybe she's ready, right? Like I think she's she's clearly a starting level setter, even a top Turkish team, in my opinion. Yeah. Yep, so I agree. I guess Maya's gonna Ojin. How do you how do you pronounce that name? Ojinovic? Ogenovic. Ogenovic. Ooh. You've, you're starting to get that those uh, European names down, eh, Dan? Well, I, I get to hear broken English all day, every day. So. <laughs> no, it's not broken. It's just uh, uh, European English is, is, is its own language. Ogenovic. Ogenovic. There's Monty's putting a nice little pronunciation guide for us in the chat right now. Thanks, Monty. Thanks, thanks, Monty. Uh, speaking of, yeah, maybe it's, it's more of an e, the e, the long e at the end. Beach, yeah. So I think I think we kind of we I think we did Champions League both sides covered it pretty well. Yeah, I, I was going to ask about uh, CEV Cup because we've got oh yeah we've got the all on the men's side we've got the all Russian league final. But um, there was a spicy path to get there in one of the semis. This is this oh. is this is true. Um, gold was it was it I need to go back set? and watch. It was I need to go back and watch that match because it wasn't on my radar. I didn't think it would be close, and then. Dude, like Masek, Masek, Belgians uh, bother me with pronunciations. That's one of the few that I'm not very good at. But uh, Belgian is really hard. Yeah, Masek beats Zenit Saint Petersburg three <laughs> nothing. Like, what are we even talking about with that? After losing three one in the last leg, like they took a set from them last time, then they beat them three zero. If this had been old champions or the, like the old scoring ways, like they would have been on. Right, because they're, they're in. Yeah, it's outrageous. So a uh, golden set, I think, it was like seventeen fifteen or eighteen sixteen. Saint Petersburg. It was crazy close. Uh, I really want, want to go back and watch that. Uh, shout out to Mitch Stahl, American on Masek. Yeah, and, and I mean, Saint Petersburg. We're missing a lot of players, though. You were they? To, you have to put that to so, yeah. Probably, uh, I'm sure. No Camejo. Camejo's been out for a while uh, now. Yeah. I think I think the only starters were Igor Kluka and Antoine Broussard. Because so they didn't no have Yakovlev, no Politaev. No, and, and Yakovlev, but no, no Politaev. Okay. Okay. Well, and, yeah. Hopefully, we see him in the finals because they're going to play Dinamo Moscow in a non-Russian league match, which is going to be cool. Uh, I, I saw Svetlana Sokolov may have, may have rolled his ankle. I hope he's okay. But then, like, yes. they can, they can play all three. Moscow can play all three of their foreigners in that match, which they normally wouldn't be able to do. So that'll be cool. That's a big advantage, actually. I agree. Uh, but yeah, do you want to talk about like the refing or anything? I guess you haven't seen the match, but uh, why was the ref? Uh, there was a lot of complaints by Joel Banks, I guess, in the uh, fit in the golden set. He, I've, I've, I've actually rarely seen a coach that angry, as angry as he was. Uh oh, uh, talk us through. All, I mean, I didn't, I didn't, I only watched part of the golden set, so I didn't see everything because uh, I was covering the other matches. But I mean, the one at the end they were really mad about is. I think a double touch on a back set um, from Antoine Broussard on a, to a position one that they scored on. And I think you guys, if you've probably listened to the podcast in a while, you know my opinion on this call is that you're already punished enough by having a bad set, so you don't need to call it, especially because it was, I think it was 14-11 or 14-12. Um, so it would have given the sake the match. And for me, like, like giving the whole matchup on a you know a 50 50 at best um double touch call and i would like i wouldn't even call it if you guys go back and look it's not that bad really um i i really disagree with uh, the sake and, and how much they were complaining because for me refing and volleyball is like even less pretty much the least impactful of any sport strongly agree uh it's by far so, the easiest sport to officiate like yeah. basketball is I, I can't stand watching basketball a lot of the time because of the impacts that the refs are able to have. Uh, football, American football, uh, it's is difficult to officiate because everything happens really fast. There are just a bunch of calls and a bunch of rules, but penalties that are subjective really affect the game there too. The only subjectivity in all of volleyball officiating is ball handling. That's it. Either a ball is in or it's not. Either a ball is touched or it's not. Either a player touches the net or he didn't. And then, of course, there's the newly controversial. Either a team touched the ball four times or they did not, which for some ridiculous reason is not reviewable. But anyway, the only thing in volleyball that should be even remotely subjective is ball handling. Uh, I actually like the I, I like the the strictness of of hands contact to be a, a little bit a little bit higher of a standard because I think the players at the top levels need to be held to a little bit higher standard than everybody else however the um 
NCAA women's for this year have already decided that literally anything, anything goes. And I know Dan loves that. I'm here because, for it. Because of, because of the same argument that you're making, and that's that why would you bother ending a point on a set that's probably going to be bad or, or detrimental anyway because of the quality of contact? I agree with that. Uh, but especially as it pertains to non-setters, like uh, if you're an outside hitter and you th- can get away with mangling the ball with your hands from 40 feet, uh, that shouldn't be acceptable in my opinion. It's, it's, but anyway, but th- that's the only thing about volleyball officiating that is even remotely debatable. Everything else should not be debatable. I think it makes the sport better for I, that reason. I, I was there's not, so sorry. Go ahead. There's nothing, nothing in officiating that other than ball handling that you can argue. It is so black and white concrete. If you have replay technology, that there should almost never be any controversy about officiating. So when when stuff comes up like this, it, it's crazy because we're not used to it in volleyball. But I think that is a a benefit to the sport as long as we can get everyone on the same page about ball handling it should take good or bad officiating totally out of the game i mean a we're you're never going to get everyone on the same page for ball handling because even like like different refs have you know different different preferences and i mean i wasn't here for this take but then you've you've convinced me you're right like it it is overall especially now especially now with the the replay system like it, it, it takes so much out of it. I mean, that's actually why uh, VNL 2019, they were testing out that different referee rule where you didn't have referees on all the corners. You had one referee standing in the baseline just looking for touches. Yep. And that was it. Because anything else, it was close. It wasn't even like the, they would just go straight to straight to, um, straight straight to the to challenge. Hawkeye, straight to video. Yeah. So any, anything that's close on in out on sidelines, just go to the computer. Don't waste the challenge. Do a referee challenge and just check it out on the computer. I, I, if you can get those touch calls, it's, it's a good thing. It was a good idea. Get those, those people like way behind the baseline looking at the block, being able to t- call those t- touch calls faster and more accurately because mm-hmm. that's the most common challenge by far yeah and if we can speed up the match by a little bit with getting those right right away and taking those challenges out of the game it, it makes the game flow a lot better i'm all here for anything that makes the game more exciting and that we take away useless whistles so like especially for me if you've got a player who's making an athletic play and the ball doesn't come out cleanly with the hands let it slide you know like it, it, it for me especially at the top level it has to be disgusting for it to be called <laughs> called a double you know um how, from how dan's describing this brizard set it should not have been called yeah right? no it, it, but even like no, 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 meat no. shield in the chat was saying that the re- there was no ref refing uh refing issue so i don't know who meat shield is on our on our uh, in our discord group but meat shield's a great name um wh- <laughs> one thing that like you know if we're going to be talking about refing and, and calls that i want to go away do you remember like a little while ago this i mean this happened briefly when i was p- playing where they changed the net rule and where that you could a it was only the top tape that was that was not allowed to be touched you could touch the the bottom the bottom mesh no problem and then and it was only if, while playing the ball if, if it was only while playing the ball or if the ball was around you so like if you were a middle blocker and you went up with the middle and the ball went to the outside and you like took the net down like that like that to me is the worst thing and I, it, it happened in one of the plays in, in the game the Lube Zaxa game where I forget who comes down and he turns and his shoulder brushes the net the ball's away like it's 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 not a dangerous play and they're going to whistle that down like that's bullshit like let the boys play let's like let's put the whistles away down referee stop trying to make this your show and you know like let's like let's loosen it up I'd love to see us go back to that net that net play where like Hey, yeah, maybe net, touching the net a little bit is is all right because it allows for like a little bit more aggression, a little bit more, you know, like it just makes it more well, sense. That that I disagree with. Uh, it, it can't you can't give people more freedom to play more aggressively by by making the rule more lenient, but you can take away the like turning around and grazing the net with your shoulder play that completely doesn't matter. You can take away the whistle blowing for that. That I agree with, but you can't give give guys more of an advantage because there are less consequences for touching the net in the course of play that should be the same and they, they've already changed that rule too too many times over the course of my playing career uh but the the down ref never makes it about himself he's just enforcing whatever rules he's told to enforce by the way but he at just, least if someone the, touches the net he blows a whistle it's how it works right now at the very top level which is i think some of these rule changes should 
probably like try and reflect the, and to improve the uh, TV products and make the game go faster. Like we've already discussed other rules, ways to reduce the side of percentage for men, right? Like why not give the defense, why not give the blocker more of an advantage? Because like we've already tested stuff like, you know, uh, banning back row attacking, banning jump serves. I think this this would be, which are both those things I hate, by the way. Yeah, they're but ridiculous. I think these, this would be like a better way. You let the block blockers be a bit more aggressive in terms of, you know, uh, piking and, and being able to seal the net. And I think that would only be better to balance between offense and defense. Well, if you're Will Fredo-Leon, for example, which I'll, I mean, all of us can so clearly relate to what his life must be like. Uh, and you are athletic enough to, while piking over the net, while blocking, to kick the bottom tape of the net. And for that to be a violation is ridiculous. That should not be uh you should not lose a point i posted a clip of Blatnitschke doing that the other, yeah the other you week. should not be penalized for being athletic enough to kick the bottom of the net but, in your block move but like <laughs> I, I, I also think that like we need to like realize too is that if as a blocker you're touching the net you're bringing the net down so if anything you're just giving advantage to the other team no nope, right? nope. That, no, we're not here for that too. No, you, you don't. You, you, can't like go, that? You, you can't go fishing in the net. No, I, and, 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 and I and I and I I don't. I I say I would love to see it go back to just like the top tape. Still have like the same feet rules so that you can't can't go to the other side of the net. But like, let's take the mesh out of the play. Let's take in you know, like the the guys who are falling into the net. Like like let's take that that out of the play. If it's in the top tape, absolutely. If you're invading into the zone, absolutely. You know, foot fault, absolutely. But other than that, let, let's take out let's take out unnecessary whistles. I like where you're coming from there. The, the my devil's advocate argument against that is to. To incorporate, like to to take away some of the things that make a net violation a net violation, brings subjectivity into the way that it's called. And I, I just praised the game of volleyball for having the least amount of subjective calls that can be made. Uh, if you're if you have to determine whether or not something was a, a net touch was done while playing the ball versus not, or if it affected the play versus not, or if it was by the ball versus like near the ball versus not, then you're just adding an element of subjectivity that worries me because I, I like that about volleyball right now. And I don't want to add more subjectivity to it, but the spirit of the argument you're making, I agree with uh, take out whistles that shouldn't be whistled. So that brings me to my next thing about officiating. I wanted to bring up. So there was a clip the other day that went all over the internet about Mikal Kubiak in Japan. Uh, good one. And he, this was the stupidest thing, the, by far the most egregious instance of this call that I have ever seen. And is the perfect one to talk about in the way that it should be officiated. Um, every, are you looking forward to pull it up? Do you know um, what I'm talking about? I don't know what you're talking about, no. So Kubiak, oh my God. This is uh, this is on the FIVB's Instagram. Uh, they... He, he initiated, he did the stupid, like, two-handed swipe thing. He initiated the joust with this oh, wait, I tiny did, little... I, I did, you yep. posted it in the chat. Yeah, yeah. So this poor little helpless Japanese blocker, he makes, get gets, gets very, like, tentative contact off the blocker's hands, then completely continues to carry the ball well after the blocker has finished touching it and flings it out of bounds with two hands and then celebrates like a loser. Uh, and he, he, my understanding is that he got the point for this. And I know we saw it in slow motion, but oh my God, this was the worst example of this whole call I have ever seen. And this needs to be something that is reviewable and it needs to start being officiated correctly, not based on who initiates the contact in that play, but who actually touched the ball last. Because it's too easy right now for pin hitters to just grab the ball and throw it. And as long as they touch the block some at some point, they win the point. That is way too easy. And uh, speaking of lowering the very, very high side out percentages in the men's game, that is a tool that is unfair offensively, in my opinion. And you need to start being able to officiate that and review it in such a way that the team that touched the ball last loses the point instead of just the blocking team loses it every time. I think that was stupid. Dude, I, I think that's interesting because uh, last year when I was doing, I was covering the playoffs. Um, and so Rob in Canada, we have the CCAA, um, which you could kind of be, it's like D3 NAIA type stuff. And then we have U sports, which is, which is D1. Yep. And yeah, I was, I've learned about the divisions I, recently. I've, you know, I was doing both matches and I found that I did like the CCAA, like the, the BC provincial championships. And then I was going to UBC 
games right afterwards. And I found that I was enjoying the college games way more, the CCAA games way more, because they didn't have the, as soon as we're in a tough situation, we're going to set that tight ball and you guys are just going to go up and you're going to push and tip and you're going to try to push and wipe. And there was so many, there was, I, I had, I counted it out. And there was like almost like double the amount of tips and control shots and stuff like that in the university game than there was in the college game. And it's because like the college guys who are like a little bit smaller and maybe not as skilled are just trying to go out there and hit the ball as, as hard as bang. they can. And I loved it. And not to mention they're using the molten too instead of the Mikasa. So that makes it makes a big a big difference. But yeah, I, like this this notion of like in, a lot of people commented on that that one arm. Um, uh, Zatorski dig too because um, Slika kind of threw it turns and throws and like I'm kind of with them on that like it's it's become a very like one arm like like let's that just... one wasn't nearly as bad as the Kubiak play yeah you're right not even close in slow mo the Kubiak in slow mo the so Slika one bad. looks bad in slow mo the Slika one looks bad but in real time you see it's fine like he just he just volleyed it yep. it's fine but, but to uh, me like I haven't seen the Kubiak one in real time but just based on how long he was touching the ball in slow mo mm -hmm. it looked so egregious yeah. to me that it, I I don't know I, I couldn't get over how bad it looked and I feel like it, that that the way that that's looked at has to be changed, yeah. especially it, when it's coming to, towards swiping the block. Like if you're just sending over a second ball, like actually uh, Kovalev, Dan, your guy, did this ridiculous setter dump a couple years ago where he grabbed the ball here and threw it downwards over the back of his head. And it was like that the only thing. <laughs> yeah, it was sick. But in my opinion, and in Loy Ball's opinion, by the way, it was illegal because he he, he contacted. The the can, can I argue the other side of this for, sure. the, for a sec? Because I've well, been, I've been to argue with you guys. Okay, so the first thing is, you know, we were just talking about trying to reduce the amount of, of whistles and, and speed the game up, and yet every single challenge call I've seen that tries to figure out who touched it last on on some of these white plays is like glacial it's excruciating because sometimes it, so it can long. be like like one like a hundredth of a second difference and it's the same thing like in basketball i find when like you're or, or or whatever sport you're trying to figure out who touches the ball last when the ball is going out of bounds like oh you've seen that go for like five minutes and you still have no idea who, who touched the ball so i feel like i almost feel like there still needs to be some way some rule that doesn't rely on, on knowing who touched the ball last? And sometimes you don't have the camera angle. And then the other part of it is, I, I don't know. I think I actually really enjoy watching some of the like wipes, tips, jousts, sneaky ways attackers can score. Because watching as much volleyball as I watch and you guys watch, sometimes it, it does feel a little samey. Like if guys have only two options, they go for hands or they go like around the block, cross line, whatever. You know that when you watch like you know. Three hours, uh, ten hours, fifteen hours of volleyball in a week. They're like, okay, I've seen this exact play all these times. I like when guys, you know, have a few options in the offensive arsenal. Like, how boring would basketball be if all they could do was layups? That was the only shot they could do. But no, like they have post moves. You can three pointers. You have like uh, mid range floaters. You have. I, I like the variety a little bit. I, I do. Too. I'm on board with that. But they, I, they, they should they should have the option. The, the, I'm not saying take the wipe out of the game. I'm just saying that if you're going to do it, you have to actually like tip it into the block, and then you have to you you can't like keep carrying it out of bounds after the blocker is done touching it. That that's the egregious like change of direction play that I don't like. But like yeah. the the wipe is a smart play if, if you don't throw it i'm i'm still in for it but like when i remember like this started happening a few years ago especially with serbia with you was euros kovacevic where anything off the the net they'd just be setting him super tight and he'd go up two hands and and wipe it and to oh, me like I, I like it i like it <laughs> being a, a a move to have but i don't like being it being like a go-to thing you know what I mean? Like I don't like how people like it's it, it's too incorporated into the offense. And like Kovacevic should not be able to do it every play. Uh, and right now he does it on every play. Exactly. And I hate and that. It's just, I it can't just, stand it. You know, for me, like that doesn't like that doesn't produce a good product of volleyball. 
where like it's if it's just like little wipes and tips and and stuff like that, it doesn't produce a good a good quality a quality of volleyball. People want to this, see this is a good debate. I like this be, debate. You know, like people want to see good swings. They want to see big blocks. Like they want to see the exciting factor, right? Imagine if like they, they want to see the finesse. They want to see something new as well. Like we're like we're 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 starting to see it in the NBA now too, where like. Who who was it? Oh, it was the Denver Nuggets last week? Had a brutal like they could have won the game. No guy wanted to take it to the hole because everyone was just sitting around the perimeter. It's like imagine oh, if we took took I took out dunking play. out of out of the NBA just because of the three point shot and it just becomes like a perimeter game where everyone's shooting trying to hit three points and nobody's going for the the big dunks. You know what I, you know what I mean? Like mm, that analogy doesn't re- really hold up for me. The, that that, that Denver play was. A breakdown. I, I think it was Jeremy Grant who was clearly to blame on that play. It was embarrassing. Yeah. Uh, that, that, that's that's our. By the way, I'm trying to look up this Kovalev dump right now for you, Dan. I'm struggling to find it, but it's it's. The, Send it to you later, but you know, I'm I'm always down for some Kovalev clips. I, uh, that's what I. I have a little playlist I play before bed every night. I'm sure you do. <laughs> Just like he, he needs to be on the national team. I can't believe he's not starting. It's, it's <laughs> Real quick. That's um, a really aggressive like level of fanboy that you have. For that guy. <laughs> I just don't get it. <laughs> real, real quick. Um, we got. Do you guys want to talk about the seventeen-year-old girl who went absolutely off um, this week in the CEV Challenge Cup? She got forty-seven points in the first game on Wednesday, and then twenty-seven in the second game on Thursday. Dan, didn't you bring this girl up on our show a couple weeks ago? I did. Yeah, you're you're on it, man. I got the scouting reports, Rob. I got the scouting reports. <laughs> um, but yeah, with Romania being one of the hosts of Eurovolley as well, it's going to be a, uh, it's going to be quite exciting. But yeah, forty-five points. That is. I mean, she got what, like nine, 90 sets. Ninety sets. I'm looking at oh the stats sheet right now. 90. She was she was forty for ninety. Forty for ninety. And this is this is the first game. This is the the game like they played. What was it? This is the second, of. Yeah, so but this is Robert, March. You March. remember from that show too? Turkey's trying to get her, right? That's right. Yeah, I remember. Tur- uh, she's trying, to, or I can't remember which side was pushing harder, but to get her Turkish citizenship. But, but yeah, yeah, so that would be just, something. So on Wednesday, she scores forty-seven points and gets ninety sets, and then on Thursday, she follows it up by getting uh, f- twenty-seven points and getting sixty-five sets. That's ridiculous. <laughs> she had 55 sets two days back to back and scored overall uh, 74 points. Wow. And can, can you say, uh, can you attempt her name for us? Um, Karutasu? No. <laughs> Karutasu? Karutasu? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure Alexia exactly Karutasu. That's not that's not that difficult. It doesn't have any like weird, you know, I'm French and I, I don't know how to say some of these, you know, like, the, some of the Turkish names are it's Turkish, Serbian, and Polish. Those are those are the three tough ones, and Russian. But Russian Russians are usually like pretty straightforward once you see them in normal letters. Po- Polish people get the angriest when you mispronounce, though. Polish is hard, man. But Italians will be like, "Oh, don't worry. Like, here's how you pronounce it. Like, no worries." Polish people are like, "I can't believe you like disrespected our <laughs> my like, country by like saying this name wrong." Like, have you have you seen your language? It's not. It's, not that simple. it's all Z's, Z's and Y's. Yeah, there's not very many vowels in that language. It's the opposite of French in that way. Yeah, yeah, it it very much is. Danny, have you learned any other languages over there? My French is like three percent better. Three percent. So from so from like five percent to eight percent. Okay, decent. Impressive. That's that's yeah. that's all right. Did you did you take French classes when you were in Canada, like up until like? I did, I did, and then forgot it all. So, you who do we got in the who do we got in the chat yeah. right now? Do, do they have anything they want us to talk about? Is is it the Italians or is Mikey in there? Um, who's hanging out with us? We've got nine viewers right now. We've got our peak. Con- oh, we've man. got peak concurrent at the, at the moment. Uh, Stichoy looks like. I don't think Monty Monty had to go. Uh, Tommy hasn't said anything in a while. Meat Shield is there. I'm not entirely sure who who Meat Shield is. Um, I just got. I think I just got like a, a spammed because we went from four, nine viewers to four real quick. So <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't really it's know. As soon as you as soon as you notice it, they they immediately run away from you. Yeah, I just got want to become famous by followers, primes, and viewers on. 
bigfollows.com. So, oh, so, terrific. Thanks. Thanks. You guys Pete. want to go over the Italian, uh, the Italian uh, game this weekend? Yeah, uh, let's talk about Italy, and then I want to talk about Athletes Unlimited because, boy, uh, maybe even I don't because maybe I'll start ranting a little I, bit too I, hard. I, I, so no, let's let's talk, let's talk, let's talk the Athletes Unlimited one. Yeah, I, sure let's have yeah. Let's let's touch into Italy real quick. Um, yeah, yeah. Let's and then and then I also because I've watched I watched a lot of Athletes Unlimited volleyball. Um, yeah, I, I I feel like Rob might have some bigger feelings on it than I do, but I'm I'm happy to. Oh. I'm happy to hear everything that's uh, that's kind of Boy, going, do I. going on. But all right, Italy, Italy. Italy we've we've, we we've got? only got we've only got one playoff game left uh, in Italy. Milano versus Verona. That is going to be going down on Sunday. Uh, the other two yep. uh, series we went as as expected. Modena over uh, Ravenna, and then uh, yeah, Piacenza, Piacenza over Padova. Um, so do we do we see like who who do we have here? Like my thought that Milano was was going to take this. It looked like they were gonna, supposed to take the last match and. I don't, they just kind of crumbled. No Stephen Marr, so obviously that's the issue. But uh, what do you guys got? <laughs> that is unironically the issue. <laughs> they need to start Marr over again. I'm sorry. It is. Oh, my God. You Canadians are unreal. Uh, you, you're, you're probably not wrong. Uh, I've still got Milano. I think they're way more talented. But old man Matej Kaziski is he's balling right now. He is balling. And how, is I'm he, hearing, how is he still so good? I have no idea. I don't understand how his knees haven't exploded. You yet. know why? Uh, I'm also hearing he hasn't Thomas played Jeski national to team in a long Rubens. time. That's true. He gets those months off, right? Like he year. he has strictly been a pro guy. He hasn't had to play national team. He hasn't played any European Cup, no Nations League, no none of that bullshit. Nothing. Nothing. He's not running ragged in t- 13 months of the year playing volleyball. He plays his season in Italy. And then he goes, you know, he probably stays in Italy, drinks a cappuccino, drinks an espresso, maybe has some wine, you know, eats some cheese, we're good to go. Like, let's go August preseason, not like, hey, I'm coming in like eight injuries, completely yeah, dead. He has, he has an actual off season, like a normal professional athlete. What a weird concept. Okay, so I just took a quick look at the stats. Guess who was the best attacker for Milano against Rona? The setter. Steven Mark. Oh really? <laughs> and, yeah, three for five. Uh, Jean Patry, five for nineteen. That's not very good. Five for nineteen, negative efficiency. Yuki Ishikawa, eleven for twenty-eight. Tina Erno, ten for twenty-eight. Ooh, not great. Tina Erno, twenty uh, percent effic- efficiency. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Like, why? What? What is the justification here? Like, Erno's not playing that well. He's not as good as a player as Mar. I'm, I'm not seeing dude it. it's been it's it. been my frustration watching Milan all season long the amount of times that I've watched them set balls to Ishikawa in system that he is getting blocked on or he's making errors on or he's like just doing continues and Mars getting garbage stuff like out of system balls like high balls in the pipe that he's finishing like putting away like if you look at their season stats like they're very they're very identical and it's it's been so frustrating how little respect Mar has been getting on that team. Like he has been their workhorse. He's played left side. He's played right side. He's led them in matches. Like he's done so much for them. And that coach is an absolute stooge. And I don't know what he's doing not putting <laughs> Stephen Mar on the court. Like it's it's just it's unfathomable to me. And I've been I've been saying it since like November. And I was like, what is going on here? Why is no one setting Mar? Oh, you're gonna set him now when he just dug a ball and now he has to get up and okay. Oh, he still got the kill. Cool. Like. Yeah, I, just watching him interact with the coach too, like in in like serve receive situations. It yeah, it's I don't know why they're not playing. Watch, they're not going to play Stephen Mar, and Verona is going to win. They're going to happen. Homerism aside, I don't disagree with you guys. I think Mar should be playing. I think he's uh, other than Patry, other than like he obviously just had a terrible game. I think if he plays average, then they probably win. But uh, put Mar in. Why not? He's probably better. Or at the very least, he's a change of pace. I think he's a good player. I like his game. So throw him in there and get Everett to stop complaining about it for a week or so. <laughs> I mean, hey, if they want to win, they got to they gotta figure it out. Well, if they well, get past that, then they get to go lose to Perugia anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Pretty, pretty much. So you know what? Maybe maybe they should just lose, not play Mar. Just lose. He can have some rest, and then we'll have him good to go for the for the. Yeah, summer, I think the, that's the what summer. you should yeah. be rooting for, selfishly, bro. Like, it, just give him an extra week or two of his off season. Well, and, and Milano's playing in the uh, Challenge Cup finals as well, guys. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that is true. Who yeah. are they going to play? They're 
one of the Ankara. Oh, Zira. Ankara, Zira, and Kasi, Ankara. Yeah, one of the. Who, one of the I, I believe it's Marty and Tanisov. Is, is there? Is there? Is there a yeah, big guy? Yeah, the Bulgarian guy. I remember that. Out to Termat, who sometimes some actually somehow actually like plays really well when he plays in Turkey. Wucher Termat always plays like there was a, a few years ago when he was on Berlin and he was just lighting things up. Like Termat is a very good club player, just doesn't really show up. He's a up. club player. He's one of those club guys. Yeah, yeah he just sure. doesn't really there show are up. Definitely some of those. those I, I think I, I think that it must be I would love to see peel behind like what goes on behind the doors of like the, the Dutch national team system and and like I'm sure that certain guys have maybe have been favored namir for like good reason so maybe it's just like one of those things where oh, it's yeah, just like namir is our guy and that that that's is what it is and like you can either be on the national team and be his backup or you cannot be on the national team and you know he might just be like hey well i mean every every national team system has its politics obviously but N namir was a setter for most of the time yeah um and still on the national team <laughs> and was and still started on the national team for his whole career yeah one thing to note about the Italian League playoffs, the quarterfinals actually get started on Tuesday. We got a match on Tuesday with uh, Monza taking on uh, um, Vibo, and then on uh, Wednesday, Modena against Lube and Trentino against Piacenza. So we're gonna get those have... series are gonna be so awesome, especially with Modena or sorry Monza versus Vibo. I'm so stoked for that series because like either one of them would go on to get smoked by Perugia anyway, but like that, that, that that's such a balanced and competitive series. I'm really excited to watch it. Yeah, I, I agree. It's going to be like two teams that really were like threatening. Like they're, they're the two teams like Perugia or, or, or um, Perugia lost to Monza. Lube lost to, to, to Vibo. Vibo. Like they're the yep. two teams that are kind of underneath that cusp and I think it's very fitting that it's those two teams are going to be playing for the spot to be kind of in that that big four th this this season you know I be fun the Ital Italian playoffs are fun just because there's so much volleyball it just goes forever uh it's awesome it's great the, is the, best, the best of three or best of five the first series is best of three and then semis and finals are best of five I think you might have to correct me on that if, if yeah, there are any Italians in the chat still. It doesn't look like it. All right, guys, let's let's do AU. Oh God. Yeah, are you guys ready? <sighs> All right. Uh, let's... You, you two set the stage, and then. Oh. Uh... All right. For those who are are listening and maybe are unaware, uh, last week we had the pleasure of inaugurating a brand new women's professional league in the United States, the Athletes Unlimited Women's Pro Volleyball League. Um, one thing to note right off the bat that it is the Athletes Unlimited brand is not strictly volleyball. They uh, also did softball in the summer time, and they are also looking towards uh, lacrosse as well too. Now, this league is a little bit different. Uh, they don't have traditional teams. They have a bank of 44-ish players, but I mean, we've seen some injuries, so I'm sure they've got some reserves who are just kind of like training players and, and, and kind of uh, underneath. Um, and every week they do a draft and you are able to win points by winning games, winning sets, and then your individual moves. And it's at the end of the day, it's going to be one ultimate champion instead of a team. Um, it uh, is, you know, there's three matches. Each team plays three matches per week. Then there's a draft on, on Tuesday. We had week number one. Um, first games were on Saturday. We had two matches, two matches Saturday, two matches Sunday, two matches uh, Monday. Who wants to start here, Rob? Do you want to? Dan, I'll, please. Dan, I'll please. start because it's it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a positive one. I I think it's pretty cool. I, I've really I've enjoyed it more than I thought I would. Um, first of all, because of the excellent, uh, you know, I'm <laughs> I'm a bit of a nerd for this kind of stuff now. But like the broadcasting stuff has been awesome. They've been broadcasting everything in sixty frames per second, which is absolutely should be mandatory in any volleyball. It's the fastest sport in the world. You need to be able to follow the ball at 60 frames a second. Tons of, of different cameras. I think they have like, looks like nine or 10 cameras on the game. They have uh, they have the crane cam. They have uh, one that's just dedicated to like reporters on the sidelines. The, cam the camera work is excellent. They had a really cool um, thing where they were following a player in one corner of the screen and then they had the whole match. Like just, just great stuff overall from, from a broadcast perspective. Um, you know, Kevin Barnett on the call, I believe. Uh, yep. Was, was great. Um, it's refreshing to hear announcers on volleyball because I feel like we haven't had that 
in a little while. And I, and I have to say, with the scoring system, like, I don't know. I, I, th- I, th- I think it's pretty cool, especially after week one, like looking at the leaders of the league. I'm like, okay, Karstolo, Jordan Larson, both like Karstolo versus Jordan Larson. Like their teams are going to face off, uh, I believe it's on, on Saturday, right, Everett? Or, or Sunday, on the 7th. The 7th. That's Sunday. Um, so like that's a cool matchup now. That's a big matchup because they're both like the two league leading leaders. It is tough to be uh, like you're never going to know all the players unless you're like really, really like – diving into it but the fact that i can just be like okay i just care about like jordan larson and carstolo like i don't really care about the other players it's easy for me to just follow one player throughout the season and it's not that big of a commitment so that's that's my positive take oh. let's hear it let's hear the other side so i, I oh my god do, do you want to go because i feel like i feel like rob i sit in the middle of you too so i think rob you can kind of hit me hit us with the other and send and then i'll come in then we can we can discuss it, but Rob, I, I feel I feel like you've got some you've got some thoughts and some feelings. So, sure do. So, first of all, I want to set the stage for people who don't really know who I am. My platform is the Volleyball League of America. Uh, this, um, please follow all all of the its various places on the internet. I have a a podcast called The Deep Corner that both of these lovely gentlemen have been on recently. Uh, it's all on the VLA's platforms. We are a startup men's professional volleyball league in the United States. Um, so there's so, so much drama and, and stuff that's gone on behind the scenes. Uh, I went on a huge rant in the discord kind of recently, if you want to read a lot of the VLA's backstory and why it came into existence. Um, but we're in the middle of a season right now. We're playing regular season volleyball with the men. Um, there are actual teams that are consistent. They are based in regions and cities and have identities and play with one another throughout the season, like a normal league would. So, it's just completely, totally opposite what I am, what my league is working on compared to what Athletes Unlimited is doing. And so here, my, my complaints start with the no teams thing. Volleyball is the most team sport on planet Earth. It is. I will not accept arguments against that. Uh, th- th- there is no more team-based sport in the world than the sport of volleyball. Maybe, every player has football, to touch the ball. Um, in American football, every player is very important, but not all of them have to touch the ball. Uh, in, in volleyball, every, every single player must touch the ball. And even more so, no single, no one player can touch the ball for more than a split second at a time. Ball hogging is impossible. One player single-handedly controlling the game is impossible. It's just the nature of the game. It is the most team sport that there can possibly be. The very least that you must have on your team is two good players. (laughs) You might be able to get away with two good players, but you cannot survive with just one. I love it for that. And the, the, the team aspect of it lends itself so phenomenally well to TV because you even... First of all, we're, 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 they're presenting volleyball to an audience right now that they're trying to reach as far as they can to the non-season volleyball viewing audience. They don't even, they might not even know who Jordan Larson is. Uh, I think they'll, the, the, the format of the league makes it so that you learn who those top five, eight, ten players are pretty quickly. But if you don't care about what team, if you don't care about like what team uh, it wins in a given match, why are you watching? If you don't care what team wins over the course of a season, why are we playing the season? What are what is anybody working towards? One player winning MVP who I can already tell you it's going to be Jordan Larson because that would be the best optics for the league, obviously. And there's there's only a select few players that even have a chance because statistically it's so hilariously weighted towards pin hitters that if you're a setter, a middle, or, or a libero, there's absolutely no chance for you to win the league. There's no way. They're, the only way that... The only people that they're even trying to crown as champions of the league are the players who would look the best for them. Jordan Larson, Carstolo, Lowe, uh, Bethany Dela Cruz, whoever. Give a Meyer. Give a Meyer a middle. She, there, there's nothing she can. She can. There's nothing she can do to win Lickman. that to win, win this league. Lick, Lickman, fine, whatever. That there's no championship. There's no playoffs. There's nothing. Why do I care about watching this if I don't? If if the team that wins doesn't matter. 
And to further reinforce the fact that the team that wins doesn't matter, the way that they award points for the winning of sets and matches is the most backwards thing I've ever seen in my life. They play three sets no matter what. No best of whatever. They play three sets no matter what to 25. If you win two of the sets, or for each set you win, you get a certain number of points. But if you win two out of the three sets, you are not guaranteed to win the match. It actually comes down to total point differential before it comes down to number of sets won. That's the most backwards thing I've ever seen in my life. It's like avoiding, awarding the World Series trophy in baseball to the team that scores the most runs across seven games instead of the team that wins four games first. It doesn't make any sense. It's not how sports work. You win the sets to win the match. In baseball, you win the games to win the series. NBA, same thing. They're, they're rewarding the exact wrong things, and it makes absolutely no sense. And then any amount of team camaraderie or chemistry that they develop, and like I said, volleyball is the most team game on the planet. It matters to be familiar with one another, to play with each other. The level of play throughout a weekend on those Monday matches is better than the Saturday matches because the teams get more comfortable with one another. So great. You make all that progress throughout the weekend, and then you completely rip it apart and start from nothing the next weekend. That makes absolutely no sense. The product of volleyball on the court is worse because they are breaking apart the teams after they have started to build something. It makes no sense. And I, I, I already talked about how I don't like the, the individual scoring because it only rewards a very select few players. So about the production, Dan is right. The production level is absolutely phenomenal. It is tremendous. It's 60 FPS. There's a ton of cameras. Just the, all the setup that they have in that gym there looks amazing. The graphics, the the sponsorships, the the interviews between sets, the just like the the content that they have dedicated content people to produce. They're throwing so much capital at this thing. Um, the the broadcasters, the announcers themselves, I'm not nearly as high on. Uh, Kevin Barnett is a, tr a very good analyst when paired with Paul Sunderland. He is not a good play-by-play -play guy. And uh, Lima, whatever her first name is, I, I don't love her. She's the classic like high-level volleyball coach that knows a lot about the game but is not good at talking about it, and it's actually frustrating to listen to. Uh, so I'm not very high on the broadcast team. But the the camera, the, the, the production quality, top to bottom, is absolutely amazing. And it's Could something that only... I, that's what I, I was going to say that too. It also the the side view camera that there's their primary takes a little bit away from the speed and the athleticism of the girls because it's too high up and you can't tell how high they're jumping and how fast the ball is moving side to side and up and down. So more baseline would be better, but whatever. We've talked about that before. What why I'm so frustrated is that this amount of capital and investment is being wasted on such a bad format. Format is awful. I don't know what their plans are down the road in future seasons, but they cannot possibly expect to have a sustainable long-term league that is known as a league if it's going to be this individual scoring system every year. Who is going to keep tuning in to watch that? Why do you care about all of these matches? You can just like follow along and not watch any of it and just bet on who the individual winner is going to be. And when that person is named at the end, great, whatever, you're the right or you're wrong. Who cares? There's no teams competing towards winning anything. So for seasons in the future, this same model makes absolutely no sense. So I don't know if they have plans to change it down the road, but there is no way that they can just keep repeating this same individual model over and over again and expect it to last more than a year or two. doesn't make sense. Meanwhile, I'm sitting here with the VLA, a, a league with teams, franchises that are attached to their local, like local states, cities, and areas that have footprints in their local volleyball scenes and that are building their own autonomy to exist under the league umbrella. That the teams go back to the PVL days of USA Volleyball in 2012 and 13. The teams have existed forever. People know the players. People understand the team's play styles, their their team cultures, their team identities. They're not broken apart year after year. And I'm sitting here just begging people to watch my show and watch our matches on YouTube for free because nobody knows about it. While meanwhile, this stupid format has all this money and production value being thrown at it. It's such a waste. If you put my league's teams on, on this same product on TV this way, it would be the it would be the biggest volleyball league in the world in six or eight years or so. It's crazy to me. They have such a great opportunity here, and they're wasting on a bad volleyball format that unfortunately might negatively impact what my league is trying to do. If people figure out that this format is stupid, why are they going to go out of their way to watch what they now assume is how all professional volleyball is? It, it, it is hurting the rest of us 
to have this format that doesn't make sense for the game of volleyball. And I'm really worried that the, that the momentum that it's creating in viewership is not going to carry over and actually do anything good for the game. But, uh, I think I think it'll it'll spark and continue some juniors numbers, which are already very very good uh, on the girls' side. It's definitely not doing anything for the men's game, and it's definitely to not be doing perfectly anything honest. For, is it is it necessarily doing even that? Right? Like are, maybe are, not. Are we, I don't are know. We, are, is this league currently and and obviously like we're 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 removed from it like I'm in Canada Dan's overseas you're there but you know is it is is the viewership right now is it a general sport viewership or is it the same Good question. general I don't know is it the same general volleyball viewership right and that's that's kind of one of my questions because let's let's be honest like volleyball is is a bit more it, it, it's on TV a little bit more. You know, especially like through the through the NCAA and and the AVP, like it's, it's there's probably a bit more mainstream awareness at, at that level in the states than than it is is here in Canada. Like, which it's a struggle to get to get volleyball on CBC and forget about having it on on TSN or or Sportsnet, right? So I think that there's like a, a general more uh, interest in in volleyball at a very general level, and you you're just you're just uh, touching that that demographic in my eyes anyways that demographic of volleyball fans both the fans who are the hardcores who watch european volleyball follow follow their favorite players follow all of that stuff but then also the casuals who don't care enough about who care about volleyball but don't care enough about it to watch it at like a national team level except when it's convenient or like at, at, at a european level so i don't necessarily think that they're going out and and growing growing this this brand and or, or growing like the viewership like i, I don't like I, I, I do really don't think that anyone there's going to be like there's possibly young girls out there who are watching this and be like cool I want to play volleyball I'm, I'm I'm absolutely seeing that they're we're probably going to see a bit of a but there's a, a good ch chance that those girls would have played volleyball anyway it's the biggest sport by far on the youth level for girls in the United States and it's not even close mm -hmm. uh, the the one sport that junior girls in the U.S. are most likely to gravitate to is volleyball anyway so if they're seeing this like cool it might prolong each of their individual careers by a year on average but it's not it's, it's not making that big of an impact on, on the reach of the sport outside the volleyball community i don't think i don't know their viewership numbers but i'm just so worried because my league has a huge opportunity this year to capitalize on the olympics uh covid screwed everything up obviously it screwed my league up we, we had a great season plan last year where which we didn't get to do any of it we got to play one weekend and that was all we all the content that we would manage to produce in an entire year. And then this year, we, we already have had some great plans for this season that we haven't been able to do still because of the pandemic. But there's always a, a little bit of a volleyball media bump in the U.S. after every Olympic cycle because it's on TV. It's accessible. People watch it and they're like, damn, this is cool. Like, why don't, why don't we watch volleyball more often? And then a week after the Olympic gold medalist is crowned, they forget about that completely. But at least during those couple of weeks, there's a big opportunity for the game of volleyball to latch onto that and to to spike their their own personal viewership and reach numbers. And I'm worried that people like other than watching and rooting for the USA because you want to root for your your country's team. In in my case, uh, who is who's going to care about volleyball if if what they're watching right now in Athletes Unlimited doesn't incentivize rooting for teams? It makes no sense to me. I I. I not only do I think it's not helping, I think it's hurting. I think my league might suffer I would, I would from this format. I mean, I think that might be a very uh, centric view on that. I, I can understand why you're why you're feeling that way, but I would I would I would maybe say that you're not necessarily um, you're not necessarily battling for audience. You know, um, I, I think at the end of the day, like whether you like it or not, Athletes Unlimited is significantly bigger than the VLA, and way that, bigger, way and, way, way and bigger. That you know that like. I don't know. I don't necessarily think it'll have a a an effect, a negative effect on you guys. I think if anything, it'll have a positive effect because you know maybe a casual is just kind of like, hey, is there something for men out there? And they're going to search it and they're going to find you guys and they're they're going to they're going to become a fan. You know, um, I don't necessarily see it it, it having an effect on you guys. Um, I do agree with you, however, that I don't see a long term. I don't just see this happening in the long term. I think there's, there's one thing that we we definitely need to like kind of make clear, I think in anyways is that Athletes Unlimited is this is their format and this is how they want to run things. This isn't like a USAV led thing. Like this isn't a volleyball led thing. Like this isn't a people within the volleyball community 
coming up with this idea and being like, hey, this is our shot and this is what we've come up with. Much, That's correct. Right? This is people way above that that don't know anything about Ooh. volleyball. They have access to a lot of capital and connections. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily that, that, go to say, like, because I wouldn't necessarily go to they say They don't that. know anything about volleyball. This format does not apply to volleyball. And that's but this, okay. But this, I, but this I, is their format. I like, though, right? This is their I like format. They, nothing all these players signed off on it, right? Like, yeah, they, 100%. That's, that's oh, because there is, there is a strong USA Volleyball organizational connection to this thing. But Absolutely, this, because they have, they have no other possibilities right and, it, and they have my league we are partnered with them and they refuse to give us any media support or any help in the media when all they're posting about is athletes unlimited right now my league has existed for longer and we're the first thing ever the first yeah, entity but... ever to unite usa vaau and jva in the u.s it's never been done before and nobody knows that nobody appreciates how big of a deal I that mean... is and meanwhile they're posting about a volleyball league with one or two of their national team players that you're just using it as a tryout feeder system for the national team while well, pr like I mean, like, producing hey, a I bad think that there's, product. There's way, there's way more. I mean, uh, a there's way more than just one or two na national team players. Like these are recognizable players who have played NCAA. Like th these players who have played NCAA, Big Ten volleyball in the NCAA is the second most watched sport. Right? These are recognizable players. I'm sorry, but the the players in the VLA are very few of them are, are recognizable. Right. And very few of them are recognizable on a volleyball scale. Right. Like you recognize them because they're, because they're local guys. But it's very much it's, it's very much no different than the Canadian Volleyball League that we have up here. That was originally the one volleyball league. That's where... not true. That's not even close to true. Loy, Loy Ball, like Nick Scherzen, Dave Wysorek, Cody like Kessel, like Steve Hunt, top... Jory Mantha, uh, Ray Zito. Like we had 20 plus professional players playing in that league. Like it's right. But like this is like we're talking about generational players. Like we're talking about Jordan Larson, who pushes the needles in the states at a national level, right? The VLA, like you're like the VLA. As much as I love what you guys are doing, and I love the product, and long term, I hundred percent agree that the VLA is 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 the model that's going to go work at. Like, there's no benefit there. Like very few of, of their athletes like Cody Kessel has been in the gym a few times for for, for the U.S., but he he's not going to be playing Nations League. Right, so there's no benefit there for for the USAV to kind of support the the VLA. I 100% agree with you as they should, right? And I've been there a million times with our with our own national federation, right? But overall, I think I personally think that you guys can only benefit from from all of this. I think that it is going to maybe, as I said, put, push some of the casuals towards you towards you guys. Um, I definitely, I think, I think that for me, I I, I like that they're doing something. You know, something is happening. And I think that at the end of the day, the and as you've seen it, Rob, probably one of the most difficult things is working with individual franchises and working with individual teams because you're not you're not you don't have everything in, in your control anymore. Right. And you have to you have to make sure that works. And what happens if all of a sudden one of your funding teams like just leaves? Right. So this is this is their way to kind of do something and keep all of all of those those costs down. They're doing it. They're trying to make a buzz about it. They're trying to do something cool. I don't think that this is a long term solution. Absolutely not. And do I think that they should be working with specific communities? Absolutely. But I mean, the fact that this is happening at all to me is, is a step in the right direction. Is, is I thought is, that too two weeks ago. I yeah. thought that too two weeks ago until I saw it on TV. I and mean, as soon as I, I saw it on TV, I was, I, I it, it legitimately like depressed me. I, I'm like actually kind of upset about it. I think to me, like the 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 TV product that it is, is very average. Is is very average. It looks great, right? Um, but like the camera angles are are very average. The reporting, all of it, is very average. Um. I have to, one of my my things I think is that they're trying to do too much. Every single match they have like a story of something that they've they've done in the community. Every single match they're interviewing someone from the annals of of USA volleyball past. You know, every single match they're talking about the scoring system and they're not actually talking about the volleyball. They're not talking about the players. They're not talking about the stories in in what it is. I mean, this is all week 1, so I'm very interested to see 
how this looks week two, week three, week four, once we start getting into the heart of it. I agree with, right? I totally agree with that. And, and one of the handicaps of having this format that is so new is that you have no choice but to spend some time explaining it in every match that you do, because there's a chance that that the, a random percentage of the population watches one match and one match only. Yeah. And you have to make sure that in that one match that anybody might happen to watch, that you explain how it all works. I agree. And I've talked about like the one podcast episode I did by myself about volleyball broadcasting uh, mentioned that exact thing. And Dan has talked about this a lot. We as a sport don't do nearly a good enough job like developing storylines. We don't, we don't mm -hmm. give a good enough picture about who players really are, why a match should matter in the, in, in the match, in the season, in the, in the saga of a rivalry between two teams in the, in the worldwide scheme of volleyball. Why does that match matter? We've never done a good job of doing that. Part of that is because there's so much volleyball going on that you have to talk about that. You don't have time to talk about those things in addition. So Athletes Unlimited is doing the opposite. They're they're trying to talk about all these things, some of which are extraneous, and they're not doing a quite a good enough job, in my opinion, yeah. talking about the volleyball and that's, why that's why the product that you're things. seeing is 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 good volleyball because it is the, the level of volleyball has been pretty high. It's I don't been, think the it's, camp. I, I it's been it's been fine. It's been all right, you know. And I definitely the cameras don't. It's been it's it's been all right in my opinion. But yeah, like you know, one of I've seen like I've seen uh, some comments on on social media from some people being like, "Oh, you guys shouldn't be doing any of the social activism stuff." No, 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 none of that stuff. And I definitely don't have that same feeling in terms of like they shouldn't be taking a stance on social issues. However, it seems to be a large portion of what they're doing is talking about the social issues that they're taking a stance on and it's 100 percent. i like i support them in doing that and i and i love that they're taking that stance but that stance is demanded from other platforms like the nba and the wnba because they're they're recognized people and people recognize them and they have clout and they you know they respect what they have to say right Whereas we're not at that point yet in volleyball. And I'm not at all saying like, this is not an at like you're an athlete shut up situation. No, that's not at all what I'm saying, but it, it is hundred percent in my opinion, taking away from the volleyball that is. And at the end of the day, like it just seems like they're trying to do too much and they're just trying to do too much. And it's just a little bit like, let's focus on the product that is as opposed to all of the other, like, like frills and stuff like that. And if you know, like, if there is some of those community service, social activism aspects, absolutely. And I, and I mean, I think we saw it because, especially a lot because it was the beginning of the season, so they had more time off. And now that they're in season, it's going to change. But I mean, the other day I saw that they were doing something like in the, the Cotton Bowl and people kind of like came in, like their teams were announced and with like different flags coming in, like flying in off an airplane. It's just like they're trying to do too much and it's just being too much of a circus. And it's standard volleyball where it's just like our sport isn't enough and we need to do a million other things to make us seem viable. And it's just like, why can't we just talk about how good, you know, this player is talking and, and go in a little in depth of, of, of what they're doing. Another big thing that I don't like about the system is that, as you said, it's it's very much it's very much centered on just those few players. So like there's, you know, all of our uh, all of our favorite volleyball blogger, um, Cy Michelle. Is she ever going to see the court at this nope. point? She's never she she hasn't seen the court at all through the first three matches. She has no points like why? You know, it, it's just tough for, for me to watch that. Um you know, Dan Dan, I, Dan. Dan hasn't said anything in a while. Let's 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 get him an, an opportunity to share some thoughts because I went on quite a rant. There. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love the I love the rant, Rob. I guess, and I agree. With, I mean, I agree with a lot of the things you guys are saying. Um, I would just say, like, back to some of the points you said earlier. I think money in the sport. I think just making the pie bigger for everyone is is a good thing. I think that we're seeing some money and volleyball between the CVC deal with the FFVB. And now athletes unlimited that we haven't seen uh, maybe Everett's the volleyball historian knows better but like we haven't seen it in a while maybe to this scale um and i, I think like if, if some of these investments pay off and the momentum gets going i think definitely the vla will benefit maybe not like directly but just the fact that people are interested in volleyball on a on a greater scale and having the casual fans and and also like 
I don't know. Volleyball hasn't penetrated the North American like psyche in any meaningful way. So why not try something different? Why not give it a shot? It's not my money. Like <laughs> I'm not risking anything. Like I'm, I, I think for like, me, like I, I'm not rooting for it to, to succeed. Just to I, I'm just looking at the net people that know about volleyball that it exists on a professional level, and I think it, it could be an introduction to the more or maybe the more serious leagues like the European leagues or VLA or something like that. Or something, or something that's more sustainable as well, right? Like if, if you've got, um, whether it's this group or, or another group that looks at this and they look at the numbers that are, that are coming of it, and I think that's what it's, it's showing you, that there is, there is a casual level of fan that exists for volleyball. And I think that in here in North America, we have such this North American-centric vision of what pro sport needs to be. Whereas like in Dan, like in Luxembourg, pro sport and in Europe in general, pro sport means you know, a lot of different things on a lot of different, le different levels. Right. And yeah. I think that maybe what this is, is, is able to do is it's able to show that, you know, volleyball can not necessarily hang with the NBAs and the NFLs, but like, like I'm, I'm sure that there's plenty of volleyball. There's a volleyball league would do be way better than most minor league baseball teams. You know, you know what I'm saying? Um, and if this is the ability to kind of showcase that and show what, the, the the sport can be at a high level that's great and i think i mean like like you guys know in the volleyball world one of the toughest things to have is to get people to work together like that's the most frustrating thing there's so many egos there's so many old whites who don't want to give up control and and haven't in a, in a long time and you know there's there's a lot of clicks and a lot of people not wanting to work together it, it, this seems to me like a great way to get a get a product out there however like i don't think like it on the on like the broadcast side of things for for example dan i, th I thought you found it was funny that they are good that they had like a screen and then they were watching like one player i thought that was useless a and it also made <laughs> it also made things a lot harder to watch and one of the things that i it was you able need to need a bigger tv ever you need a bigger tv and hey hey who is that who is that featured player who is that featured player every single time Oh yeah, Jordan, it's Jordan, Jordan Larson, My girl, okay. Jordan, Larson or Jordan Larson, or Carstella. But So for for me, I had the benefit of watching most of these matches with my girlfriend, and my girlfriend knows nothing. Everything she knows about volleyball, she's learned in the past year because of me. You know, like that's this is this is her extent. She's and she is a, a uh, not a sport person at all. She didn't watch sports until being living with me, and you know. She, even before I mentioned anything about the baseline angle, we were watching games in the fall <laughs> and it was on a side view and she goes, this game's a lot harder to watch because the camera's always moving and I don't like watching it from the side. And I was just like, oh my God, this is, this is amazing. But she was talking <laughs> about how confusing it was to have like the lower box and how how jarring it was because you had the one camera following the ball on the other one and the other camera moving a different, different way uh, uh, on the other way. And like... It seems to me like they were just trying to replicate what other sports do and not really putting into volleyball. But I think I think that can be, you know, that can be rectified. Do I thought it was worth trying. I thought I thought it was cool that they, that they tried it. I'm not a huge fan of it either, but I thought it was cool that one they were able to do that. Not very many volleyball broadcasts are capable of that. Actually, none of them. Uh but I thought it was cool that they tried it. Why not? That's right. Uh, wh why not try it? Yeah. I I no, I, I, not, I honestly that's don't. How I feel about this league, Rob? Why not? Why, like why? Yeah. Why not try? It? Why not try it? Because Absolutely. Because fundamentally, it doesn't make any sense. You're taking all, all away all the things that are great about volleyball and completely taking yeah, them away. Yeah, but they're doing the same thing with softball. Or they're doing the same thing. Softball with is an individual game, but it's still a team. You, you, it's still a team game. No, right? it's not. You are an individual batter against an individual pitcher with some defenders with some defenders behind them. Yeah, but it's it's, it's the, more than just that. Like, it, it, in terms not of much. Being it's on a little a bit. It's a little bit more than just that. But in, in each individual interaction within the game, it is the pitcher versus the batter, and then when the batter makes contact, the other eight players come into play. That's it. I'm interested to see how they do lacrosse with all of this because that is where things to get messy because both Look, both baseball and volleyball have very straightforward stat lines that you can follow. But like how do you do it with lacrosse? Like do you do you point someone for like time of possession? Like numbers of slashes given? Like you know yeah, like, that that one I'm really worried because it has serious ball hogging potential. And if there's individual incentive for holding onto the ball versus passing it, that can be nothing but bad. It's one of the things that I hate about the sport of basketball sometimes. 
games. But I, I think overall, I well, think it would be hilarious. It, 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 <laughs> it would be, be funny. It would be funny. People get pissed at each other to like <laughs> give the ball, give the ball. It would be. That's how it's gonna go. If, if there's if the, if the goal is to win, as as you, the individual player, in, in a sport where it is possible to hold on to the ball, why wouldn't you? That's fair. So, okay, question. Um, Rob, are you watching Athletes Unlimited Volleyball this weekend? Yeah, I think I will. <laughs> okay, uh, after all of that. I, okay. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to watch. Uh, I have a couple friends playing in it. I, I hope my friend Val Nickel is healthy. I hope her ankle yeah. allows her to go back and play. Um, but the, I, I'm, I'm just curious to see if my if my impressions of it a week later or if like – if they make any adjustments after the first weekend or the second weekend, if they, if, but if they go out there and they, and they roll out like the exact same feel, the exact same format of, of like broadcasting and all, and all the details as last weekend, I'm probably going to be pretty pissed and I'm already kind of pissed. So really that, that I haven't noticed. Yeah. That, 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 that won't take much to, to get me, but I'm, I am planning on watching a little bit, but I'm not going to go out of my way to plan my weekend around watching it. Like I did last weekend. Cause it was the first time that, that is not something that I'll probably do again. Yeah, I, uh, I I think I'm with you on on that one. Where I'm gonna if 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 it's I mean the the nice thing about it is that it's on in the evening as opposed to the, all the other volleyball we watch, which Sorry, is always, Dan. which is always during <laughs> the day. You mean, you mean three <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So it's it's something that like you know like, I mean we've already watched all of the Netflix. We've watched everything that there is is to be. You know we play video games. I don't know. It's just like it's just something else to watch. And if that's probably probably why we'll turn on, but yeah, I, I do agree. Like, there's no, there's very little intrigue. There's very little excitement, other than the fact that it's happening. I, I agree. In 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 one individual match, Team Blue versus Team Orange, Arstolo versus uh, versus Team Larson. Guys, who must watch? Who cares? Who cares? I, I like the, those those two players can. We'll we'll have their couple, like one on one individual matchups, blocker versus hitter. But why wouldn't you just put them on stat on different static teams that you care about who wins, and you have the same individual battles that happen? Like when Robbie. when when Wilfredo Leon plays against Micah Christensen, and that blocker hit up matchup matters to me. Yeah, him. Yeah, that guy. The guy whose jersey you buy because he's the best player in the world, and because you care about when his team wins or loses, you care about him winning championships. You care about LeBron James, whether he does, whether you hate him or not, whether whether the team that he is on wins the NBA championship because that matters for his individual resume. Yeah, there's the Raptors. Yeah, it matters, 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 matters for LeBron's individual resume as a player, the number of team championships that he's won. It doesn't matter as much if you hate the lakers or if you hate the heat or if you hate the cleveland cavaliers but or like in leon's case if you hate zenit kazan or if you hate perugia or if you are a fan of those teams the uh, wilfredo leon's accomplishments matter because of what his team is able to win nobody cares if he wins all the mvps because everybody knows he's the best player in the world he should win all those mvps anyway who cares who cares if he's the best individual player in a given match or even in a given season what matters is if he's able to carry his team across the finish line and win a championship. That's the only thing that that matters in sports. It's who wins the ultimate prize. And there's in, in the most team game in the world, there cannot be an individual ultimate prize. It doesn't make sense. It should only be the MVP, which we've already discussed today, is usually bullshit anyways. So, I mean, <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's interesting. Um, I mean, hey, they're doing it. They're giving people an option. I think it's definitely important to note that this is – this is not the volleyball community. It's coming from the outside of the volleyball community. And Correct. so it's not, in a lot of ways, it's not using volleyball community money, which there and isn't really place, that, that much their of place in the Their place on the calendar as it relates to the COVID pandemic really matters because a player like a Jordan Larson or like a Carstolo in a normal year would have been overseas playing. The only reason that they're stateside right now, the reason why most of those players are stateside right now is because COVID got in the way of... of their normal 
overseas professional career. But not, but uh, not only other... that, I think it's like perfect benefit for the USAV to be like, hey guys, guess what? We're gearing up for the Olympics and there's one fucking thing we want to do. We want USA women's volleyball to win a fucking gold medal at the Olympics. That's what we That's want, right? right? So guess what? You, we're going to give you the entire fall off and then you're going to get to train here in the States. Like that to me, that's exactly why the USAV is, is 100% behind this, right? Because they see like like all of their players who are overseas, like think about like Haley Washington, Micah, Micah Hancock, all, all of these girls, like they are dog tired right now. They're at the end of the season. Right. Whereas any girl who's played Athletes Unlimited is in a, like they're like they've played a few games. They're starting like they are in a perfect position to peak come Tokyo. I agree that that that's yeah. It's it's an absolute win win for the USA Volleyball Organization with their players on the national team. It is helping them to have a better chance of gold medal, and it's giving the the athletes their bodies a more normal calendar at, compared to the average pro athlete, but not even close to the average professional volleyball player that they never usually get. So yeah, good for them. Good for them. They, their 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 bodies will be in better shape. They won't be as burnt out come Olympic time. Cool. But that is why those players are in the states right now versus another normal year if they were interested in making money they would be overseas that's the, just the, the fact right the there. best format was the indian pro league they should, they should, they should have done oh that. i remember this from a couple of years ago 100 percent, i agree the indian pro, the pro league was great sets to 15 beautiful i'm all about straight up i'm all about the sets to 15 now because how many like lull in the sets like the most exciting time is the end of the set let's have more end of sets Right, a more end of literally sense. Giovanni Guidetti on the last Ace Space podcast, um, which is great, was a great listen by the way. If you want to listen to that, he's like, "Yeah, I don't watch men's volleyball until 17 points." <laughs> oh wow, Harsh. cool. So yeah, let's go to 15, 15 point sets. But, make, like make the make best more volleyball sense. coach maybe in the world is, is saying that. So. Like let's let's bring in the super points that they had in in the in Indian. Points. That was the great. The, the, the what, <laughs> dude? So once a set, each team could call a super point. You had to be serving, right? You had to be serving. Or yeah, you had to be serving. You had to be serving, and you could call a super point. So you pressed a button, and it was like, bow, 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 like air horns and lights and everything. And basically, okay. that point was worth two or three points. Two points. Two points. So it was worth like double the amount of points, but it was worth two points for either side. So you could Ooh. like you could stack up and like you could do it in like a matchup that you really liked, and you're like. Pff, we're going into the we're going into the super point and it could change the set and when you're only playing to 15 man it could it could it could change it all but yeah i like the indian pro volleyball league i heard some stories of how like unorganized it was from the back end because there's a lot of canadians canadians in it but uh there were actually a couple of americans i think david lee and paul lotman went over yeah but both 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 the guys were were there uh i mean they weren't mvp like our boy rudy verhoof though so uh good try thanks for coming out boys um but uh, but yeah, it it, it, sound, it sounded like some of the stuff was crazy unorganized on the back end, and basically like it was like it was classic, good, good to go. Like Rudy was like, "Hey man, you should be messaged because Irvin Brar, who's like an Indian guy from uh, from Canada, who was just the MVP of the Danish Cup, was going to go play, and like he was going to be like a big star for them too." And like he was gearing up to go play and Rudy was going to play. And when Rudy and I talked to the Vancouver open, he was like, yo, text these guys. Cause like, I think you could come. Like, I think they would pay for you to come make some content. And I was like, great. And then, yeah. Next thing you know, there's like lawsuits going on and they didn't pay their taxes. And you know, just that sounds like a certain other league that I know that has legal issues going on. Oh, well, okay. We've, we've talked enough that's about another, that's, that's we, another we podcast. Rob yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm we not, want I'm not you to save your voice, Rob, for the week. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm not touching that one. Exactly. Well, boys, it's been over two hours now, so uh, I think I think it's getting down. What time is it there? It's nine p.m. It's dinner time. It's dinner time. Jeez. Dinner time. Jeez, yes, definitely, definitely dinner time. Well, thank you very much for for joining us today. That was I, I we went longer than I even I thought we would. Uh, but Classic. That, that was that was great. When does any subset of this group of three ever not go longer than expected? <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty much. Um, but yeah, Dan, any any closing remarks you got to say? Any any plugs? Anything anything you got for us? Um, hmm. yeah, I, I hopefully this weekend if I'm, if I'm actually organized, Polish All Star video on my YouTube. So uh, Polish regular season ending, doing All Star team. 
Do you guys, I mean, I can probably just share it here if you guys want to hear it quickly. Sure. Yeah, run, do it. run it down really quick. Uh, Camille Semeniuk, Taylor Sander. Um, then I have Peter Novakovsky, Jakub Kulanovsky in the middle. Ben Tony Udi setting. Jakub Pompevishak at Libero. So not Satorsky, which I feel kind of silly now after the last uh, couple <laughs> weeks. Um, and then opposite, Carol Butrin. Uh, oh, nice. So, okay. Yeah, Butrin's won every single MVP for Soviet. I honestly cool. have not watched that much. I've watched more Polish Women's League because I've watched a lot of Varsovia or Rezhov, Um, but I haven't watched that much Men's League. Just a lot of Zaxa. But anything... that, that league is difficult to consume. Uh, it's it, There's barriers to watching those games, especially for me. Yeah, well, I paid, uh, I paid for IPLA. No, yeah, once you pay for IPLA TV, you can get everything. Like, it's it's great. Yeah, Polish League is, like, the easiest one, I would yeah. say. It's, it's cheap, and, it, and it's, it's... all... Every game is broadcast, yeah. like, with, like, five cameras... 1080p full 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 production yeah uh, i mean just just accessing it is difficult for americans is it is it blocked in america okay. i i haven't i've never been able to get it but maybe i'm just doing it wrong it, it anyway, uh, TV. but yeah rob do you get do you get anything any shout outs <laughs> sure so first of all dan and i have a show that was supposed to be today uh it's Check every out. friday at at 11 a.m eastern it's uh Five five o'clock p.m. Central European time. Uh, we talk about a lot of European volleyball stuff, and we talk to the YouTube chat. It's very cool. Uh, it's gotten phenomenal engagement the past few weeks. I think Dan at, and at, at the CV are happily surprised with how well it's doing. Yeah, it's crazy, kind of, actually crazy how well. It's yeah, it's just kind of an, an experiment that you had and some people in your office had, and I'm I'm happy that you asked me to be a part of it. But so far, it's going really well. So if you want to be very interactive and hear more about europe every friday then tune in with that and then like i said my stuff on the vla's platforms um i just interviewed a guy this morning that'll come out on my podcast the deep corner on tuesday uh, his name is don sujo and he is a legend and he has some unbelievable stories so former uh, national team setter for the usa that's right he went to two olympics he backed up Lloyd ball for a while uh he came from communist albania in europe and moved to the u.s with nothing and knowing nothing about college and then was the national player of the year at usc he's he's got he's got a crazy story so look forward to that and then our the next regular season event for the vla will be in april i don't know what weekend it's very difficult to plan events with covid but uh We've got one in upstate New York, one of the weekends in April with uh, the Chicago Icemen, Team LVC, and then a Tier 2 team from Boston. And that will be a sick weekend. So follow all the VLA stuff. Rob, you should use uh, your login to the Volleyball Source website to post that on the website when it when it comes by. Same with, I will. Same with your uh, your podcast. Make sure, it, make sure it gets up there so oh, the, okay. the, the people can... Uh, yeah, and then it'll just go to the Facebook feed and, and all of that. And um, there's... We've got a bunch of Americans following volleyball source, so I'm sure I'm sure I'm sure they'd they'd love to check that out. Sweet. I appreciate that. All right. Well, boys, thank you very much. That was great. Thanks for taking the time. That was that was a long one. We we covered a lot of stuff. Uh Dan, go get some food. Rob, enjoy the rest of the day and hey, we'll uh we'll talk soon. Thanks, boys. Peace. Have a good weekend. Don't forget to follow the uh, volleyball source Discord. Links down below. True, yeah. Hop in the Discord. <laughs> Peace.